Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Education Fast Forward 8 debate. Today, we have 44 participants from 14 countries across 18 telepresence locations joining us for the Education Fast Forward 8 debate. All our invited guests, fellows, speakers, and audience watching the live stream and tweeting are most welcome. Education Fast Forward 7 debate involved Andreas Schleicher and Carol Bellamy. In that debate, we looked at the challenges to need, the challenges regarding the need for both quality education and adequate access to education. Today, in Education Fast Forward 8, we want, what, want to do what we think is the next logical stage. That is the challenge of the drive towards new pedagogies and the reality of teacher behaviours and their capacity to adopt new pedagogies. Michael Fullan, the former dean of the uh, Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, will put the, the, the case forward for new, for new pedagogies and Kristen Weatherby, the, a senior policy analyst at uh, OECD, will put the case for teacher reality. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Gavin Dykes, who will introduce our two guest speakers more fully. Thank you, David, and good, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whichever part of the world you're in, uh, to this EFF8 debate. It's my delight to introduce our first speaker, so, as has just been said, uh, Michael Fullan is the Dean of the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. Uh, he's a prolific author, and he's been advisor to ministries and governments all, road, all over the world, uh, and uh, has demonstrated the value of uh, using pedagogy as well and organising things well in his uh, home state of, or home province of Ontario. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Michael now to speak on new pedagogies for deep learning. Michael. Okay, thank you, Gavin, and hello, everybody around the world. Uh, I want to uh, just say a few things and then present uh, a small number of slides. What I'm about to say, uh, we and others are doing around the world. I won't name all the groups, but uh, this is not about the study of pedagogy. This is about the doing of it. So this is very much action-based. It's, uh, it's also what we call whole system. It's not just a few schools. It's all schools in given jurisdictions. So action doing is first thing. And then I, I think I want to summarize the solution into three parts that have to happen in concert. One is uh, operationalizing what is meant by deep learning, uh, the deep learning, uh, not only the tasks, but the outcomes. And uh, there are various ways of doing that. But uh, in some of the formulations, we've referred to the six C's, which are critical thinking, communication, et cetera. And we've added uh, citizenship and character education as uh, uh, other kinds of skills. So that's one version, but we're going further than that. And I think the deep learning image I have are students who, um, and, uh, who are doing change and becoming prepared. And uh, we call it right now education plus. So we're trying to operationalize what the learning uh, task and outcomes are. So I'm going to say that's one third of the solution. The second third of the solution is the new pedagogies which I'll define generally as a new learning partnership between and among students and teachers, a new learning partnership between and among student teachers. So delving into exactly what that means is the second part. And then the third third is, uh, is about the infrastructure. And I, I'll be very interested in uh, Kristen's take on it through the TELUS survey. Uh, basically, uh, it, it's this that you need degrees of autonomy at the school level among the teaching profession. Uh, degrees of autonomy, uh, so in the, in the scheme of things. And those, those degrees of autonomy, I want to put it this way, it's autonomy from the bureaucracy, but not from each other. I hope that makes sense. Uh, teachers, in other words, uh, need to be uh, uh, required, I guess I'll say, and supported in interacting with each other. So degrees of autonomy at the level of the teaching profession in action. 
And then the second part of that, and this is what actually uh, OECD and Andreas are discovering about school autonomy, you need uh, an infrastructure uh, and a set of strategies that continually mobilize knowledge and in innovation and ideas and feed the system. Uh, it's not vertical accountability. It is, uh, it is an infrastructure of knowledge um, stimulation on a constant built-in basis. Uh, so those are the three things that we think have to be put into place. And of course, a, lot of, a certain number of policies around the world about the teaching profession are contrary to what I just described in terms of either they leave teachers alone too much in school autonomy, or they, uh, they try to run it from the center in a more content-driven way from the center. I'm not talking about either of those. I'm talking about a more dynamic thing where these three parts, including that knowledge-based infrastructure, in action is the solution. So I want to go through the slides here, if I could. Uh, I did this short book called Stratosphere, which we tried to bring these three things together of change, knowledge, technology, and pedagogy. I've given you a tripartite version just a minute ago, but the, the book is based on that. Uh, secondly, we could take uh, what I call the push and pull factors. The push factor, and this is just one slide of many from the U.S., the push factor is that students are increasingly bored as they go up the grade levels under the current system, almost every country. The data are pretty clear. Students are increasingly bored. Teachers, uh, and we did actually recently uh, film in three schools to display this, three schools in Ontario. And I love what the principal said. He said, well, actually, teachers were bored too, but they didn't know it until they ex experienced the difference, as they did and as we captured on these films, which will be available in January. So what, what we have is teachers, uh, students uh, disengaged and bored, teachers alienated um, uh, in, in, in the direct way, in the micro sense, but in the macro way because of the way that, uh, that policies are being uh, developed. I'll take Australia, U.S., for example, policies about the teaching profession that are contrary to the model I just described. So those, are that, those two things are the push. They're pushing uh, students and teachers out of engagement. Uh, uh, it's, psychologically and literally, in fact. Uh, and then the pull factor is the kind of the, the pedagogy in the digital world, which is irresistible, not all good, but uh, our, our attitude towards this, uh, Andy Hargraves and I formulated a guideline once for things that are coming at you that are inevitable. The guideline was this, if, if something's coming at you and it's inevitable, your best bet is to move towards the danger and figure out how to sort it out on your terms. So it's a proactive, look at technology. I uh, just have a couple more slides. The criteria that I set for this in Stratosphere is that the new learning experiences, including the radical change of roles of teachers and students working together, is that this new experience must be irresistibly engaging for both students and teachers. It must be um, elegantly efficient and easy to use. I, to me, that's the kind of Steve Jobs criterion. You build the complexity in the design of the technology and maximize ease of use and access. It has to use technology 24-7. This is moving towards the danger. And it, uh, it, it has steeped in real-life problem solving. So that, that's the kind of image of uh, what we want to accomplish at the micro side, although I say again, the macro infrastructure is really crucial here. Uh, when you look at the roles of teachers and students, I put here a slide that's uh, from John Hattie's uh, work, and uh, uh, the, it's really quite interesting because we are defining this new role as, the, uh, as, a, as a learning partnership, so it involves teachers. And you see in this cluster, the two clusters that he made, and his effect size, that he says that effect size of 0.40 or larger is worth looking at, below is not. So you see teacher as facilitator has an inconsequential effect size in terms of the, this is a student engagement and student learning, and teacher as activator has a, a more pronounced impact. The implications for this are twofold for me. One is you see in the facilitator category a couple of uh, 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 digital uh, uh, simulations and gaming and web-based, and they're associated with weak impact. And my take on that is they are, in his research, associated with weak impact oh, because they were used yeah. poorly pedagogically. That's why it's weak. They were used poorly pedagogically. Uh, in other words, pedagogy wasn't driving technology. It was, uh, it was more passive. Uh, the second implication is that the, so, the famous uh, saying, the guide on the side for teachers doesn't, is not a good, the guide on the side is a weak pedagogue. We need a more proactive partnership between uh, those that are 
uh, the teachers, including students as teachers, uh, as well as formal teachers. So in that domain of uh, defining the teacher as activator and the student as partner, that's what we're working on. I'll give you one version uh, towards the end. So the, uh, here's a, a bit of a big, messy slide that uh, uh, I'm doing a report for, uh, we just finished it now, and again, it'll be out in January, the Education Week uh, in London. We're going to launch it. It's called a rich seam, S-E-A-M, uh, how uh, new pedagogies are finding deep learning. And so Maria Langworthy, who's based in Seattle, and uh, myself have done this report commissioned by Michael Barber's group at Pearson in London. And this is just a starter list. We're trying to sort out what are the combination of roles. Uh, it brings in a lot, of, uh, a lot of the people who have spoken about the need for changes. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson, for example, uh, his, his uh, uh, leaders in, in terms of finding your element, as he says it, are not passive. They're mentors, they're helping develop, and they're looking at uh, uh, ideas and sorting it out. Uh, in our filming that we did in um, the three schools and the systems that they represent in Ontario, it's very clear that the change process is, uh, is something like directional vision, the three parts, directional vision, uh, letting go, so allowing lots of uh, innovations and change, and then reining in uh, to consolidate and then keep going and, and iterating that way. So it's a dynamic change process. And in our report, uh, the, the Rich Seam report, this is how we're basing the, uh, um, the, the model. Uh, we're, we're mapping out the deep learning, but they're also, we're talking about newness, and here's a debate we need to have. What is new about this? Because a lot of these things have been around for a while. I think what is new is it's, it's a whole system. It's ordinary schools that are doing this. It's uh, done on a very large scale, and the change can happen rapidly, as, as we're seeing in these examples. So there's new degrees of pedagogical partnership. There's new change leadership that's more dynamic at the school level and the system level. And the last one, uh, the new system economics, I had a throwaway line in Stratosphere, which was, welcome to Stratosphere, where you get twice the learning for half the price. And, uh, and I don't, I, I actually uh, almost mean it literally now, but you certainly get twice the learning for the same price. Uh, the, the learning day is, is lengthened to be uh, 12 hours instead of six boring hours, you get 12 good hours. Uh, the students' engagement is in, in increasingly uh, strong, and it's, it's I'm going to say, to put it crassly, free labor. Uh, but students are learning, and there's not, not a lot of cost to this. So we're doing an, an analysis here, the economical analysis, say what are the, not to save money, but to have higher yield and to put money to better use. So this, I'm going to say, is exciting. Uh, I'd be interested to see what the new data that uh, Kristen has from um, from the TALIS survey, because the, there's two things I want to end with. Is one version is that this will be so appealing that teachers, if we have the right strategies, can rapidly evolve into this new role over the next three years. The other scenario is this is such a radical change and teachers aren't prepared for it. It won't happen. It'll take forever. And so that it's a, it's a more, uh, I go say, negative scenario. So we want to be realistic. We want to think that this can be done uh, really dynamically. 2013 is a year of uh, signaling this new stuff for us, and we think it's going to happen on a really wide scale, even if you don't do anything, so to speak. But if we get in there and do things, we'll even make it better. So that's what I'd like to lay out to start with. Michael, thank you very much for that excellent introduction and uh, a whole host of ideas in there. If you're sitting in one of the TP units, I dare say you must have a number of questions you'd like to ask. Uh, so I'd like you to hold on to those for the moment, keep them for a little bit later. If you're watching through the video stream and online, uh, please make sure you can throw those tweets in now. Uh, and we, we will try and build uh, as many of them into the conversation as we possibly can. Uh, but make sure that you're uh, ready for giving questions to both our speakers and also to engage in the debate as a whole. Um, so now we move to uh, Kristen Weatherby. Kristen Weatherby works at the OECD in Paris. Uh, she has worked previously for Microsoft and has been a teacher. And who better to have in charge of the TALIS, the Teaching and Learning International Survey work at the OECD than Kristen. So over to you, Kristen. Uh, and Kristen is going to speak about who are our teachers today. Great. Thank you very much, Gavin. And I just wanted to thank Promethean and Education Fast Forward for inviting me to participate in this debate. Um, 
and to Cisco for these beautiful facilities. As far as I'm concerned, any day when one gets to share the stage with Michael Fullen is a good day, and plus I get to talk to you about teachers, so it's even better. Um, as Gavin mentioned, I, I manage the Teaching and Learning International Survey at the OECD. It surveys a representative sample of lower secondary school teachers around the world about their working conditions and the learning environments in their schools. Um, I'm going to be using TALIS data as a framework for my conversation today. Today's conversations are essentially about making teaching better so that we can both improve and change the kind of learning outcomes we see from students. And there should be no debate on the importance of teachers in order to raise the quality of an education system as a whole. There's a large body of international research that suggests that teacher and teaching related factors are the single biggest within school influences on student achievement. And international... <clears throat> yes. Sorry, can I ask you to hold there? We're getting some feedback through the, through the system, so could you make sure that you are on mute if you're in one of the teleprison systems at the moment? Sorry to disturb you, Chris. That's okay. Should I keep going? Yes, keep going. Keep going, okay. I was just going to say that international student assessments such as PISA and TIMS also confirm that, um, that teacher-related factors really make a huge difference. Uh, PISA and TIMS continually show that student performance varies more within schools than it does between schools in countries. So raising the quality and equity of schooling uh, depends on making sure that teachers are highly skilled, well-resourced, and also motivated to perform at their best. So before we go too far along the conversation that Michael started about changing the kind of learning that we want to see from students and thus developing the kind of teaching that we need to make that happen, I'd like to start with where we are today. What do uh, the international data tell us about what teachers are actually doing in the classroom? Then we can look at the kind of development, support, and feedback that teachers are being provided with, and we can see where the gaps in policy and practice lie that are preventing us from getting from where we are today to where Michael and I and probably everybody else in this conversation would like us to be. So I mentioned that I'm going to be using the TALIS data as a framework. This is data is from 2008. Unfortunately, as Michael said, he was looking forward to our new data. We're in the midst of analyzing it right now, and that will be released in 2014. And in fact, I would love to give some commentary on some of the school autonomy issues that Michael said, but I'm sworn into secrecy. We're just looking at that data right now on school autonomy. Okay, but, Kristen, um, everyone has promised to keep it secret, so go on, let us just tell us. <laughs> yeah, this is a private conversation, right? It is, yeah. it is just private, I promise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My lips are sealed, Jim. So, um, but I should mention that TALIS does not measure teaching effectiveness. It's not an evaluation of teachers. And in fact, it's a self-report survey. So we're not actually in the classroom observing teachers, but we ask them a lot of questions about what they're doing in their teaching practice. And that's what I'd like to talk about now. Um, if we could show this first slide, um, based on the international research around teaching effectiveness, we developed a number of questions that essentially divide classroom teaching practices into three larger groups, as you can see here. We look first at student orientation practices. So this is associated with socio-constructivist theories of learning and encompasses student-directed or student-led learning. Then we ask teachers what they're doing around in what we call enhanced activities. So this could be independent group work, student discussions, and things that we love like project-based learning. And finally, uh, research in educational effectiveness shows that structuring practices are also important. This could be considered more teacher-led learning, uh, teacher-led instruction, excuse me. And the structuring questions, you can see some of them here, ask teachers um, about whether they use strategies that clarify the structure of a unit or lesson and its goals, and also whether they test whether all students have understood a concept and perform certain tasks. So what we're trying to do with these data is not to pit constructivist and direct instruction approaches against each other and say that one is good and the other is bad. But we want to look at how and how often teachers are able to use a variety of these practices. At the end of the day, we know that there is no single best way of teaching. Teachers must continually be able to adapt their practices to the needs of a specific context uh, or class or students. 
So this notion of being fluent in a number of different pedagogies is really quite important. So what we did is we created profiles of teachers who report using these practices regularly in their teaching. And what we saw was that our, although there are teachers in every country who report a consistent use of a variety of teaching practices, in fact, it's only a minority of teachers who are able to do this, between 5 and 15 percent, and that's it. Um, so this data about whether teachers are able to use a variety of practices is actually important to Michael's conversation as well, I think, because how can we get teachers to adopt uh, new pedagogies or to develop new pedagogies if they're unable to make consistent use of a variety of practices now? When we took um, a look at the country level, we saw differences as well in the kind of practices that were used. We found that country by country, there were similarities in the kinds of teaching practices that teachers favor. So this suggests that teaching practices are also influenced by pedagogical traditions and national cultures. And it's something that's supported by other international research, such as the data from the Tim's video study back in the 90s. We then took a closer look at those teachers who are able to teach with a variety of practices. We wanted to see uh, what other correlates might be related to this. And what we found, and I don't think this is going to surprise anybody, is that the teachers who report the most frequent use of a variety of teaching practices are also those teachers who have higher levels of self-efficacy. So this means they feel more confident about their own abilities as teachers. They are more involved in professional development, and this also was especially prevalent with professional development outside of a school. And they receive more appraisal and feedback on their practice more often. So it's this whole picture that we want to look at. Um, we want to see how we know that professional development and appraisal contributes to the development of new teaching practices. So let's look at what teachers are saying about the kinds of experiences they have with professional development and appraisal as well. So first, I'll look at professional development. You can see on this slide um, illustrated a key finding from TALIS, and that is that most teachers are receiving professional development. This is good news. This chart shows that 90% of teachers have taken at least 15 days of professional development in the 18 months prior to the TALIS survey. And you can see here, for countries like Mexico, Korea, Poland, and Spain, they're actually getting quite a lot more. So that's good. What does this actually mean? What we found is that there's considerable variation in both the incidence and intensity of professional development, um, teacher participation in professional development. And this is both within countries and across countries. So we asked teachers about the types of professional development that they attended and what kind of influence it had on their teaching practices. And this can actually help explain some of the variations we saw between countries. Countries which had a higher percentage of teachers taking part in qualification programs or research activities tended to have a higher number of average days of participation. And as you can see from this chart, only a small minority of teachers actually participate in those kinds of activities. And it's a shame because you can also see from this chart that those are the activities that teachers said had the most impact on the development of their practice. So another interesting finding in TALIS is that regardless of the fact that teachers are receiving all this development, there's still 55% of teachers who report wanting more professional development. And what are they saying that they need? This chart actually looks at the difference between what new teachers are requesting or requiring in terms of professional development and what their experienced colleagues are saying they need. New teachers for TALIS are teachers who've been teaching two years or less. And you can see here that, perhaps not surprisingly, there's some differences in what new teachers say they need versus their more experienced colleagues. Um, a quarter of the more experienced teachers would like more help teaching with ICT skills, whereas new teachers tend to need more help around areas of student discipline and classroom management. Um, but all teachers, I think one of the interesting findings from TALIS is that all teachers, 33% um, of all teachers, would like more help around teaching students with special learning needs. So it's this idea of being able to have more tools in your toolbox, so to speak, to reach the variety of students that you see in your classroom every day. So we also ask teachers why they're not getting the professional development that they need. What are some of the barriers that they're experiencing? 
The most common barrier that was reported by nearly half of the teachers in TALIS was just a conflict with their work schedule. There's not enough time. And almost as many teachers cited that there just weren't any suitable professional development opportunities available for their needs at that time. So these are two things that we'll want to consider as we think of the professional development that's needed for developing new pedagogies. Let's now look um, at the feedback that teachers say they receive on their teaching, which is also very important um, in the development of new teaching practices. And while a majority of teachers, in fact, a vast majority of teachers, uh, say that they receive feedback on their teaching once a year, there's still one in four teachers who say they never get any feedback on their teaching from their school principal, and nearly a third report never hearing any feedback from other teachers. So you can imagine these teachers, I imagine these teachers, in their classroom, doors shut, and they're never hearing anything about their teaching. How are they supposed to change? TALIS tells us that teachers who do receive feedback view it positively. So 83% of teachers surveyed in TALIS uh, agree that the appraisal and feedback they're receiving is fair, and 73% find it helpful in the development of their work. Again, this is good. Teachers want to hear uh, about their teaching. And appraisal and feedback, we know, can help build confidence in teachers in their work. Uh, the more feedback teachers in TALIS received on specific aspects of their teaching, the more they trusted their abilities in these areas. Again, this is not surprising. It's not rocket science. Uh, teachers also reported that appraisal leads to changes in the specific areas on which it focuses. So this also makes sense. Emphasizing certain areas in a teacher's practice over others shows them what is most and least valued in their teaching. So if promoting innovative practice is important, this should actually figure prominently in a teacher's appraisal and feedback. Unfortunately, what we're finding is that often it does not. Let's just look at this next slide here. Um, this is one of my least favorite findings of TALIS. Uh, teachers are saying that they aren't recognized for being uh, better teachers or for being more innovative in their teaching. You can see here that on average across TALIS countries, Three quarters of teachers are reporting that they would receive no recognition for increasing the quality of their teaching and no recognition for teaching more innovatively. So why should teachers change at all? So what does all this mean, summing up? If we want teachers to be able to teach in a variety of ways, to reach more students in their classrooms, much less develop new pedagogies and use new tools that are available to them today, we need to show them that, first of all, this matters. Innovation and better teaching quality is important, and we can all do better in assessing and rewarding good teaching in ways that motivate teachers to keep doing this. Secondly, and we all know this, but meaning, prof meaningful professional development is really important as well. So as I mentioned, one of the questions we might talk about today is, is uh, what kind of professional development is needed to get teachers to teach in the way that really uh, encourages deep learning, learning for students. But I think that the TALIS data on um, teacher needs around professional development today and the barriers they're seeing in receiving professional development is important as well. So thank you. I look forward to seeing where the debate takes us. Kristen, thank you very much indeed. Um, some interesting data there, and uh, I think always good to keep in mind that this is um, self-determined data or people giving feedback about their own practice, and I think that is uh, additionally revealing, perhaps. I, and Gavin, I, can I, I make a comment? I'm not sure it's allowed, but I'll just ask. I, I, was, I was going to just get one or two comments from one or two others, if I might, Michael, and then, sure. just, and then come back to both you and Kristen to, to see how things are from there. Okay, so, good. I, if that's okay. So uh, I, I want to pick on a couple of people, not really, but uh, Kirsten in Copenhagen, I'd wondered with, from your partners in learning work, if you've got any reflections on what you've heard and uh, uh, the one, the ambition of new pedagogies and the reality of where teachers are that has been talked about so far. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Gavin. Well, for sure, the, with the Partners in Learning Programme in Microsoft, we are supporting teachers' professional development and we very much try to focus on doing this in the way that the research on, on Michael and Maria Rangwood's paper on new pedagogy for deep learning, the, that route that is bringing us. So focusing on 
what we call the, the 60s or 21st century skills on how to develop that, how to learn, how to implement that into the teaching and learning process. That is one of our big focus area this year. And we're running uh, workshops on trying to train professional trainers in order to go back and train teachers across the countries to do so. So very much in line with the new pedagogy for deep learning. Excellent. Thank you. Oops. Sorry. Thank you, Kirsten. I, I, I want to uh, also call on uh, Stephen in, um, or Steve Kenny in Bedford Lakes as a head of a, a, a chain of academy just to give your feedback in terms of the picture that's been painted. Uh, any, any comments for, from you? Yeah, it's really interesting, um, Gavin. I'm totally on board, everything's been said. The difficulty we have is um, the way schools operate at the present time, and uh, I think teachers are particularly the problem. And I think many teachers, unfortunately, have uh, been brought up in a culture where it's not good to take risks and to try different things, and that's been their upbringing. I was reading somewhere the other day that when we're four-year-olds, uh, we actually do take risks, but our system doesn't praise creativity and innovation. So it's very difficult. So when you ask teachers what CPD they want, they go for the easy option. So I think we have to start to develop systems and structures where we actually do review what's going on and help people to take risks and to look at CPD, which makes them develop research ideas and share good practice, and really to look at what students need. I mean, we're very lucky. We're working with Dr. Russ Quarley, which I know you guys work with, and we've been using his aspirations framework for a while. And so we ask the students what they think about their learning on a, on a big scale and try and develop student engagement through that. But it's a long, slow process when you've got an examination system in some countries, which is going against what you're trying to do. So it's about trying to uh, beat the system by using that at the same time, but trying to get ways around it and do, do things like project-based learning, but you know, develop it to get the exam results. So it's really good what I hear. So I'm fully supportive of what's been said. Thanks, Steve. That's, that's great. And I just one, one other opinion. Eliane in uh, Beirut, uh, it would be great to hear from you with your work in student tra uh, teacher training, um, yes. how much this rings true for you. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to the discussion. I, um, I'd like to say my experience with teachers has been very, very positive uh, as compared to, uh, to, to what research says. Uh, research says it's time-consuming, it's overloading, uh, it's disconnected from practice. But when you work with them and you provide them with intrinsic motivation, it just... Um, uh, and the appraisal, the, re the, the, the trust, the feedback they get from experts, the connection to practice, there's an intrinsic change in their practice. Um, I've seen more change in research uh, through the research that I'm conducting uh, in science teachers, uh, particularly those that are applying critical inquiry in their classroom and using environments that are engaging. Uh, the change is amazing because as they learn and they acquire and get confidence and become more closer partners with their students, uh, that gets generated out of the classroom and they get more, more trust with their principles. And that snowballs between uh, their self-confidence, the appraisal they get, the trust and partnership with their students. What I have found lacking uh, is embedding assessment strategies uh, throughout, so when it's really exciting, they can say um, we've we can really uh, see tangible uh, results. It's difficult for them to pinpoint where uh, where the transformation uh, in them has has happened. They say yes, it's amazing. I can see it, but they're not able to pinpoint it. Uh, the change is there. The critical inquiry is there. The trust between uh, students and, and, and teachers have helped uh, that generate and, and snowball in the schools so that they take on and say, well, I can invest more time in it. It's benefiting for me. And it, it's becoming a school approach rather than just a teacher-student approach or a teacher alone take, taking PD. And, and so um, with the help of uh, here, Jim, we've been researching this closer and I've been inspired by the work of Kristen uh, and I've used some of her questions for, uh, with teachers and uh, we're going, I'm trying to understand closer um, how that both that social emancipatory change in teachers 
is being we're able to support it with those pedagogies to support social cognitive uh, transformation as well and becoming a school approach. So the research is uh, we're going to have part one, uh, hopefully published soon, and then continue with part two uh, at a larger level. Thanks, Eliane. That's that's great. I think that uh, if I can then throw the ball back to, to you, Michael, first and then to Kristen, just uh, to, to respond to the different things that have been said since you spoke. Do you mind if I just interject just before my question? We, we still have got a little bit of feedback, so somebody has got their PC maybe connected as well as their... So if you could all just check that your PC hasn't got uh, sound on. Uh, just got a little bit of feedback, which is spoiling the experience a little bit. But anyway, over to Michael. Michael. Thank you. Yeah, I want to um, ask a rhetorical question, but first say that um, that the goal should be to change the teaching profession and the learning culture of, of students in the fastest possible way within the next three years. That should be the goal. There's a sense of urgency. And I want to, the rhetorical question is this, which of the following three strategies has the most impact on improving teaching, learning, and performance? Strategy one, teacher appraisal. Strategy two, professional development. Strategy three, collaborative cultures. I've loaded the deck. Uh, profession, uh, uh, teacher appraisal will never be intense enough to be the driver. Uh, I don't mean it shouldn't be there, but it will never be intense enough as an experience. Professional development will never be strong enough to make a difference because it's what happens in between the workshops that counts, not just the workshops. So we want to flip this on its head and say, uh, and I think the new stuff on school autonomy is uh, leading in this direction, the school autonomy that works is best called collective autonomy. It's not individual autonomy. It's the collective autonomy of teachers working together. And the infrastructure is the, uh, is the infrastructure that will um, uh, help incentivize a collaborative culture laterally and hierarchically to get this work done, including accountability in it. So my, my point, I, I think my concern about uh, the data from TALIS is it will lead to the wrong conclusion which is we need to strengthen teacher appraisal and professional development. And I say the conclusion is we need to stra uh, strengthen the collaborative culture and then, in addition to that, use appraisal and professional development. But clearly the order is, as I think, as I've just described, collaborative culture, if you want to change the group, use the group to change the group. And then reinforce it with the appropriate appraisal and professional development uh, experiences. Thanks, Michael. That's, uh, that's really fascinating. And that, that whole move to greater networking collaboration um, is, it seems to be growing in importance and uh, hopefully intensity. Kristen, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I, I would love to. I don't disagree with Michael at all. And um, in fact, we do ask uh, some questions in TALIS and that get at the collaborative culture, so to speak, that teachers experience in school. We ask them about their uh, collaborative professional development opportunities, and we don't see a lot of take up there. Um, and we also ask a number of questions that then have been analyzed to see whether teachers are part of professional learning communities in their school. And I think professional learning communities are something that's talked about all the time. Um, and it's kind of a, a, a great buzzword in professional development because you have a lot of uh, system level at a school level professional development everybody's working towards the same thing focused on learning for their students but then uh, when we asked questions to identify whether teachers are actually part of a professional learning community we found that very few across countries are so we're talking about these kinds of collaborative things happening at, even at a school level um, and we're finding in talus that that it's just not happening very much so i think that there's um there's quite a challenge we have in front of us in terms of changing teachers in the next three years. And, and it needs to happen at a ground-up level, but also at a top-down level. And one of the interesting pieces of information that I would say is, is some of the comments we get from governments in terms of looking at, you know, how often should we run TELUS? It are things like teachers don't change that often. We don't need to do it any more than every five years. So it's kind of telling that, that we want to make these rapid changes, but people are already reluctant to the top-down level uh, to think of teachers possibly changing that quickly. Oh, thank you, Chris. I, I, I think it's interesting. It, it, it makes me wonder why, when we do professional development, 
we, we effectively are taking the first step and building a bit of a community, but we don't take the subsequent steps. But over to Michelle. Yes, that's further. Yeah, I, I Gavin, you can't hear her. You put oh. us on mute, Gavin. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Gavin put us on mute. He was but just so used to we, doing we it. We didn't want to listen to you, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> so I, my point was I, I was going to make is around collaborative practices. Um, I think you get the most effective professional development opportunities when teachers teach in the same environment together. I go back to my own days when I was a teacher. I used to have a, a, an education <laughs> support person come into my classroom and it just made so much difference. It made me really look at my teaching through her eyes. And I think that's the problem, is teachers teach in classrooms on their own. They don't teach in collaborative team teaching environments. And I've, the best schools I've been to are the ones where team teaching goes on. And it's not necessarily in the same subject areas. They could be teachers in, in other subject areas. So um, that, that was the, the first point I'll make. And I'll, I'll come back to the second one, because I want to give other people a chance to talk. OK. I've done it again. I've just switched it off when I'm speaking, which is... You haven't had I your knew. professional development. No, I need, I need my system. own professional yeah. development. <laughs> Another three years and I'll be fine. Um, uh, Gavin, can I, I comment this? Please do. I think that's why the new Pedagogies for Deep Learning project is so interesting, because it doesn't just look at teachers' professional development, it looks at school leaders and it looks at system level. And if we don't have all three parts integrated. I don't believe change will happen, and definitely not quickly. Thank you. I Gavin, can, can I come in? It's Tony McKay. Why not, Tony? You go ahead. Thank you. Well, just, uh, Kristen, this is a way of um, asking you to comment at some point uh, about what you see as being the trends without revealing anything about the release of the next round of TELUS data. Um, so, in other words, it's to encourage you to release the next round of TELUS data. Uh, but I realise that you can't. Let me just try this on you. There's been a bit of distance between 2008 and 2013. And I want to go back to Michael's three-part solution and ask us all, Gavin, do we think that we're heading in the right direction, not at the speed that Michael is talking about, but at least could we predict that we're closing the gap between what we have now and what we'd like. And I want to go to the three parts of Michael's solution. First, in the last five years, there's never been the kind of intensity of discussion around what deep learning looks like. We have got every jurisdiction around the globe talking about deep learning, either in the form of 21st century skills, competencies, capabilities, and they're not just talking about the nature of the learning, they're also talking about the nature of the tasks. Second, in the last five years, learner agency in many, many jurisdictions is of a completely different order than what it was a few years ago. It used to be learner voice. Now it's learner agency, that is, greater efficacy in the area of teaching and learning. And, in fact, in many jurisdictions, it's getting into learner leadership. In other words, we're getting a shift in power. And if you want to accelerate the nature of the repertoire, get young people into that space in the way that Michael is suggesting as a way of getting the new partnership. So I'm, I'm positing a situation that says that on the deep learning we're getting acceleration and on the question about partnership we're getting acceleration. I think the biggest area in which I've seen the shift across multiple jurisdictions in the last five years is in the third, and that is in the territory of the knowledge-based infrastructure. I mean, we've just come off four years of work with OECD on innovative learning environments. We could spend a lot of time talking about what is actually happening across 40 different countries where we've gathered examples of this work, and I see it translated into pedagogy. Now, it, the question would be whether or not, in that third area, that, that collaborative space, it really is starting to show us opportunities, Michelle, of the kind that you're actually talking about. But by the way, I don't know that I'm with Michael entirely on the three-part scenario approach. So it just strikes me that if you take the collaborative environment, then you are into feedback. Feedback, for me, is a way of thinking about appraisal and evaluation. But I know why you're teasing it out as you are, Michael. But my point is this, Kristen. At some point, you and Michael might like to respond. We should be able to predict that come 2014, when TELUS comes out, we are starting to see some shifts in the direction of the three-part solution 
that Michael has outlined. The big question then is how do we accelerate it further? Jim, can I can I ask a question? Yeah, you can, Tom indeed. Carroll. Hi, Tom. So, hey, Tom, you, you, Tom, you should just come in and talk. Okay, so I'm just I just want to ask one question. Listening to this, um, is it possible for us to think about a, a new pedagogy in which there are no teachers and no students, just learners, expert learners and novice learners, who collaborate together? on uh, authentic learning challenges, real-life learning challenges, so that we move beyond the idea that the teachers are in a collaborative learning space with each other and the students are in a collaborative project-based learning environment with each other that the teachers are managing. But what if we just for a moment thought about schools or pedagogy where there are no teachers and no students, that we abandon those roles, and we simply say that they're all learners, some are expert learners, some are novice learners, they're all collaborating on authentic learning challenges. That's a question. Yep, I'm just going to bring in Jim now. There. I've just spent um, just under two weeks in, in Asia, in uh, Brunei, then Vietnam, and we worked with, uh, with Professor Lee, who's online in Seoul, with um, 120 teachers in Brunei, and then about 160 in Vietnam. And we asked them the same question. Uh, where do you think teachers are on their readiness to do any of this? And the answer we got was pretty much not ready. So the, the, my rhetorical question I want to throw is, are, are we really doing the right thing to talk about the top right-hand corner of the McKinsey graph when the teachers are largely in the bottom left-hand corner of the McKinsey graph? And as long as we talk about the top right-hand corner and don't talk about the journey, then perhaps in three years' time we'll be having the same conversation again. Because if Lord Putnam was here, he said on the first EFF debate, uh, which, remember, stands for Education Fast Forward, we do want to try to get education to move faster forward through this debate, he said he's had the same conversation with perhaps different words 20 years ago. So what are we going to do to actually move on this journey? That, that's my Actually, I'd love that not to be a rhetorical question, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> so who has the answer? But, but it's, you know, should we be beating ourselves up for talking too much about top right? And should we be talking about a bit of the right of the bottom or halfway on the right? How can we make progress? There, there's a whole piece here which I think is about the... Um, what is the learning experience that we give or we allow teachers when they are doing professional development and how can we take them from where they are to where, they, where we would like them to be. And I'm not sure that is addressed always. We're not actually dealing with the new pedagogies in the way that we de deal with teacher training. But I, I wonder if I can bring in Professor Lee uh, to just add to that since you've been mentioned in dispatches by Jim already. Hello, this is Okwa Lee from Seoul, Korea. Uh, Hearing all the present, uh, you okay? Uh, hearing uh, the presentations for from uh, uh, Michael and uh, Christine, uh, I was wondering what me as a teacher at a school of education for uh, pre-service teachers, what should we do to produce or to uh, uh, collaborate uh, better? with teachers and in-service uh, in teachers. Um, the place where the professional development is needed the most are the faculty members at a school of education, I think. They have no opportunities, or well, they do have opportunities, but they have no um uh, immediate uh, com com uh, motivation for getting into this new direction. Uh, they are very comfortable and happy with what they have and do not feel the emergency of this change and this direction. So how can you motivate those teachers at School of Education? For me, that is the biggest um, um, problem uh, big task for me to uh, to tackle in the next the three years. 
not those uh, teachers in the uh, classroom, but more the faculty members at the School of Education. Thank you, Professor Lee. Um, I'd like to turn to... Uh, I think there's lots of questions hanging in the air, so if anybody is contributing, if they can be uh, addressing those and building off the back of them, that is great. Uh, but Michael Ferdick in Toronto would like to come in. Thanks, Gavin. And I think building on the, the idea of everyone being a learner reminds me of Shirley Grover, who is the first principal of the School of the Future that Microsoft developed in partnership with the um, city of Philadelphia. She referred to herself as the chief learner. And it really made a big difference in this, the culture at the school. And so I think that's something that everyone can take on already is in terms of redefining those roles. But I wanted to chime in about, a bit about the issue of time. And, and Kristen mentioned, you know, the number one issue, a barrier behind PD was people not feeling like they had the time. Here in Canada, a few weeks ago, we had the Canadian Education Association Conference, What's Standing in the Way of Change and Learning? And over 500 people, overwhelmingly time and the amount of, of stuff that teachers had to pack into the day was, was the biggest barrier. So the Minister of Education in Alberta, who's the chair of our National Ministers of Education Council, spoke about reducing the curriculum load in Alberta and simplifying things, which is exciting. But here in Toronto, we've been working with a family of schools and the school board uh, the Toronto District School Board, on a new model of professional learning, which is about blended learning that gives teachers that, that collaborative community. It really builds their capacity over many weeks. And the biggest difference, I think, is they've invested in release time so that the educators aren't forced to do this after school or on their own time, but they've got that investment in time over a period of a month. And, and in doing so, after the evaluation last year, we saw a 25% jump in the number of educators who felt like their peers were collaborating and committed to improving teaching and learning, and they had that opportunity. So I think it's important to invest not just in one-off PD and not just in the after-school or the evening kind of courses for people to do on their own, but sustained engagement over time during school hours. We've seen a huge difference when that's happened. Thank you, Michael. That's, uh, uh, Gavin, good, good, uh, good thank you. Yes, Harry, actually, I was, do you know, you were next on my list, so I don't know how that worked, but Sorry. you're there. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 am just, I just want to say that I'm very inspired by Michael's uh, uh, notions of new pedagogies and deep learning, and I also agree very much with Kristen's observations on um, the lack of available uh, professional development options in general. Uh, the idea of conflict uh, with the schedules of teachers is really a serious issue in many schools and universities where I serve now. Um, the lack of incentives and recognition. I agree with all of those things. And I, I want to tell you that uh, for that reason, while working at UNESCO, I worked for 13 years at UNESCO. I worked with Jim and Michelle, who are here in the group, on addressing some of those challenges by thinking of what we used to call the ICT competency framework for teachers, which put the groundwork for the skills needed by teachers. But as I joined the uni academia back again, we did a very nice experiment this month by trying to inspire teachers and students uh, in a school of science and engineering. We brought a state-of-the-art technical computing platform in the hands of 3,000 students and about 200 teachers or faculty. Uh, the faculty refused to react uh, while the students jumped all over it, and we have a huge gap now between the students' reaction to technology and the faculty. Um, but the faculty, what they needed the most, other than incentives, was peer mentoring. They really didn't want the standard uh, workshop-style teaching. They wanted peer mentoring, subject-specific training uh, that seems to be working and exciting them. The, and we are also changing our policy in the university by putting innovation in teaching as part of the tenure and promotion for faculty. But for school level, I just want to say that in many countries, the assessment and national exams have a lot to do with the resistance to integration of technology because teachers serve the purpose of leading the students to those exams. And those exams seem to, to be a big bottleneck. Gavin, it's, um, it's Greg Butler here in Hong Kong, and I'd like to pick up on, on Tarek's comment and, and also to throw out to the debate, I think maybe the elephant in the room is the fact that we do have such archaic and old-style assessments that are driving teaching practice and, and teaching and learning. And I'll take a line from uh, Michael and Maria's paper where they talk about new measures, ex new measures of learning 
accelerated by technology. And I think one of the challenges we face that I'd like to hear people talk about is the fact that while we keep the current approach to assessment, I'm sure we're limited in how far we can go. And we need new thinking, new approaches, and leveraging technology so that assessment serves learning in very, very rapid cycles, rather than these traditional modes of undertaking assessment and not getting any feedback or getting feedback maybe weeks, months, or even years later. So I'd love to hear us talk more about <clears throat> how we can change new measures that will enable these new pedagogies. Thanks, Thanks Greg. I think that's, that's, uh, oh, Mr okay. Chavez, I'm very pleased Please. to see you. Uh, I, <laughs> why don't you go ahead? Uh, OK, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I liked very much hearing... Uh, a question that I don't think was answered so far is that uh, to the extent that we start identifying the problem as, say, student board and, and teacher frustration, we bag a solution that is a school-focused. If we, instead of speaking of a new pedagogy for uh, teachers and students speak of a new pedagogy for learners, uh, we not only take the categories teacher and student out of the focus, we take the school out of the, out of the focus. I think that uh, the elephant in the room, as Greg Butler said, is, is not assessment, is not uh, technology, is that our solutions to the problem of learning and to the problem of uh, making younger people capable of acting in society, in their private lives, uh, in their social roles, in their jobs, is the fact that uh, we still see education as school-based. I don't think teachers are the problem. Teaching is. It's the model around which our schools uh, and uh, educational activities are, um, are centered. So I'd like to see people attempt to answer at the question that was put up uh, some minutes before. Thanks, Eduardo. And uh, I, think, I think we're just, we're just going to come to there. there. There's a couple of things running around uh, for me that I, 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 I I'm interested in. Can I interject? But, can you, can you wait one second, just, and sure. I'll come back to you? One of the things is the, um, the question of... Uh, we talked about innovation and teaching. I love what Tarek said about, essentially, the integration of innovation into the way that things are working at the university. And that's one of the things that stands out in comparison to where we... Uh, uh, Kristen's uh, talk about uh, taking people... Out, it not being integrated, it being something, it's the t professional development being something on top. And actually, how much better is it, or is it better, if you actually integrate things in? But just before we kind of step towards the assessment, the first thing I'd like to go to is to Donna and Beth von Lakes, who I think would have a different view on, on all of this, and I'd be very pleased to hear from her, with apologies to whoever I've cut off, cut off briefly. Um, but we'll we, come we, back to you. We've got plenty of time. For we have, yeah. yeah. Donna, could you, could you say something about your work and how all this relates to it? Well, um, <laughs> I, I was taking lots of notes of what everybody was saying, and um, the the, fine, the last speaker um, from Sao Paulo... Um, Eduardo Chavez. Yes. Um, his, uh, his view that uh, pedagogy should be uh, learner-centred, and I wrote down the, the term here having um, social learning contracts, perhaps. Um, earlier on, the, the, there was a mention of uh, the cycle of assessment. Um, teachers are, are meeting performance indicators, but maybe if, if the assessment was uh, contextualised with, within the learners and the, learning and the learners' environments, i.e. their families um, and their, their communities... Um, which is a focus of uh, of our, um, our our teaching learning style um, to have families very much involved to have communities involved so we're getting direct feedback from those contexts 
Um, so the the indicators of performance are are direct, are live and direct. So is it worth uh, just saying a little bit more about what your work is? Um, Do you want to comment um, a bit more? But I think you're, you're, I think you're hide, Donna. I think you're hiding something really special here because you don't work in school. You work on with learners out of school. And I think. Well, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I should <laughs> mention that. And I think there's a lady from Budapest who also said she was uh, representing learners out of a school environment. Um, so um, the learners that come to us are learners who are often, um, for whatever reason. Um, are not able to access school um, of, of any level, of different levels, so that we have very young learners at primary level um, right through to, to post-16s, I believe. Um, and they work very much in the same space. So we, can, we do have intergenerational um, learning going on in those spaces. In some cases, uh, learners, we, we interact directly with families, parents, carers, guardians uh, will come and they will engage in family-centred learning so that it's reinforced again in the home uh, and back in the community. And word gets out um, that, that we've got a, a lovely, great grapevine where people will pass on, you know, look, this is working. I'm understanding directly what my son, my daughter is doing. Um, and um, the different styles of learning as well, so that it's not all written, it's accessible because um, we are also communicating different concepts using, um, I don't know, I would call it the embodiment of, of, um, of maths, for example, through dance and, and through sound, through drumming and these kinds of methods. So uh, people are able to easily go uh, away and practice this at home and in the community as well. Thank you for that. that that's brilliant. I... I... I think I cut somebody off, and I'm not sure who it was. Was it Eliane? Yep, that was me. Ah. Well, yeah, I, won't I won't do it again. Say... You speak now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I wanted to interject on um, on what Michael was saying, and to to say um, that we we kind of always think of one. Um, we look for solutions that fit all. And in education, there isn't one solution that fit all. And when we look at schools that are system, we need to look at um, how things work within those schools. And I totally agree that the three things are very important, the collaboration, the pedagogy, and the structure. Because within school structures that are highly bureaucratic, you're, it's the, the bureaucracy trickles down on the authority figure of the teacher as becoming uh, a top-down giver rather than somebody who collaborates and partners with students. So looking at the system and looking at the change through the system is important, but what we need to try and look at is different solutions for different systems because not all systems are the same and we need to accept that and we need to, uh, we need to be in, able to individualize those solutions to schools so that they are, make sense within those systems. Because change is happening in different perspective, in different way. We also think in terms of linearity, where this is what will happen, then this is what will happen, and then this will happen in terms of teacher growth. And that is not what really is happening. They learn in different ways. Pe teachers are, pe it's stru the structures are made of people, pedagogy, and people are different. And every person will react differently to different learning. And if we, um, if we provide those opportunities to teachers and learn from them how they're changing, and we provide opportunities for collaboration, things will change and will create different systems of change for schools. Thank you, Elena. Um, yes. I, I, I think what we'll, we, I'd like to move on to is just digging in a little bit deeper on the, some of those issues associated with pedagogy. And Can I join Jim, in? Join uh, Jim in. is... Jim, I think, is going to say a few words on that. Yes, yeah, someone was trying to join in there, so I, I don't know who that was. I, I wanted to join in, if possible. Go for it. Just go for it. From Budapest? Yep. Can you Keep hear talking. me? Um, okay. Um, I just wanted to reflect on, because I was, I was called in a way in. Um, I'm re representing parents, and I want to put a new point into this discussion about parents. We, as uh, the European Parents Association, we consider parents as lifelong learners. And usually they are not considered as 
part of the teaching process in many countries and in many schools. But um, you have to keep in mind that for changes, you have to persuade parents because they are major decision makers here. They ha in, in most of the countries, they have a say on whether they are enrolling their children into schools with innovative teaching methods or the ones that will offer something that they are used to, that they accepted uh, as the good teaching methods 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we have to persuade them that uh, school has to be changed and we have to tell them why it's necessary and why it should be completely different from the way they uh, used to be as school students. Because if we cannot persuade uh, the parents, it's very, very difficult to change schools. Thank you. I, and with that, to Jim. Thank you. I, it's to my shame that I hadn't picked up the work of uh, Shulman from 2005. Uh, talking about signature pedagogies. Uh, we often talk about teacher behaviour, I guess, or learner behaviour, or what works with learners, but we, we seem to forget about the curriculum. Um, and, and in that breath, by the way, for me, assessment and the curriculum are one and the same thing. And we don't think about the wisdom that we've picked up over the last 3,000 years about the pedagogies which are linked to different learning objectives and the way in which that wisdom can help any, anyone in charge of learning, whether that's the learner themselves or their learning guide, uh, to really think hard about uh, what is the best way to teach fractions, according to that wisdom out there. So I think there are these, um, I think it just rings true with me or it resonates with me that there are signatures, pedagogical signatures that are crucial to help teachers make some of these steps. And you, you, you know my crack record, that if we want teachers to move on a journey, we have to give them success. So we have to find ways of helping teachers be more effective, in whether that's a home teacher or, or, or whatever. Um, I'm feeling guilty for using the word teacher at the moment. Uh, <laughs> but haven't we got to get down to brass tacks and talk about learning objectives and, and the curriculum that's associated with those learning objectives and the assessments that are associated with those learning objectives? Hasn't that got to be somewhere in the equation? I think... I think that's yes. Gavin. You I, almost put yourself on mute again, I didn't you? I need to <laughs> Gavin, Gavin, it's Astamari here. Uh, Hello, Ast Ast go ahead. Hi, I'd like to make a contribution to what was said from the uh, Budapest. I think it's very important the importance of parents. My colleague has spoken about family, and I feel that this is the missing element to engage family in our practice, in our schooling. We use a, a pedagogy that is family centered and family directed. So I think this is what's missing. Do you feel, to the, to the panel of debate, do you feel the standard system can engage parents and families into the pedagogy? In our practice, we invite the parents to learn about the pedagogy that we're using with the children so that they can know how to work it in their own home environment. Do you feel that oh, the standard system can embrace that? Is that uh, too much outside of its vision? Uh, the gentleman who spoke about moving the border between the, the idea of a teacher and a student, this is very much in our way, in our pedagogical form, whereby the teacher, uh, even the terms for the teacher and the term for the student, the words are very similar, they're interrelated, and practically the teacher is known as the advanced learner, and then you have the learner. So this mm. idea is, is very uh, traditional from our cultural point of view. I feel that culture is a missing conversation point, and also family-directed learning, and inviting the parent to know much more about the, the very root idea of the pedagogy, whatever it is. Yeah, Gavin, Thank it's Michael Pollan. Uh, okay, Michael. Uh, yeah, um, there's so many strands here, it's hard to know where to start, but I wanted to pick up two or three. Uh, one, in our work in the new pedagogies, the... Um, the label of teacher and, and student is um, being eradicated in favor of the learner. So it's in that direction. So that just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, but, but the second thing is uh, we want ordinary schools to change quickly, not, not kind of innovative schools that are just out in the, uh, out in the front. And the, the, the notion of moving suddenly to uh, not having these roles is in the category that I have as a change strategy, which I call 
being right is not a strategy for change. Just because you're right doesn't mean it's a strategy for change. So, uh, so uh, and we have seen uh, teachers and students change quickly within three years uh, with this new role. And I just wanted to go to collaboration again. It's not just collaboration that we're talking about, uh, as in, for example, we don't want teachers who don't know what they're doing to learn from each other. That's not the collaboration we're talking about. What are the criteria of good collaboration? Criteria of good collaboration are when it's linked to outcomes, when it can be uh, evidence-based, when it can be shared, but can prove all of those things. It's much more dynamic in that uh, phase. So I really do think that uh, moving to the role of everyone as a learner and even the school not looking the way it is, is probably the direction but I think we have to build up the capacity of students as well as teachers in moving towards that as we define it. Last point uh, was mentioned from uh, South Korea about uh, pre-service teacher education. Uh, it's, to me, it's a, I agree with it in one sense. I was a dean of education for 15 years. When we, when we went over to the government to start the reform in t Ontario in 2003, someone asked, shouldn't we invest in changing initial teacher education? And people like me, just coming from the university, said no for two reasons. One is the teachers coming through were not all that bad anyways. And secondly, we didn't want to engage in a 100-year battle to change the culture of the university. Uh, it was not a, going to be a very good proposition of how to spend the time. And so, uh, and, and, and I think it's a logical fallacy to say if we get pre-service right, other things will fall into place. For example, in business, we don't say, if only we got the MBA right, businesses would be improved. No, we improve business, qua business, uh, internally to it. That's what I'm talking about in the systems. And then it will put pressure back on the initial teacher education. But I wouldn't start there to try to unpack it. it just, it's logical, but, uh, but just, uh, it's just too much of an uphill battle. And it's going to be far more better to leverage changes in the culture of uh, how learning happens and that's going to be the big powerhouse for levering forward, I think. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, think there, I, there's, I just want to say a couple of words, and then I want to bring in Keith Kruger uh, on, yeah, on something I'd like particular. To on something. Yeah, can I can I come back to you, uh, David? Just uh, I just want to say a couple of things. One one is um, just a couple of recent experiences were with uh, in India. Uh, seeing uh, classes in, village in, in, in villages of India, and I'm mentioning this really because uh, Ramji Raghavan, who's one of our fellows, is not on the call today, but I think it's, it, it's the work of his foundation, Augustia Foundation. What they were doing there were uh, running classes in the evening for, uh, for the young students, uh, for the children in schools, to help them to catch up. And this was in cases where parents uh, didn't have the capacity to do it themselves. So it links to the, what has been mentioned about parents and how you bridge that gap and actually how you change the culture so that they begin to value education rather than necessarily getting people straight out into the fields, uh, but they can lift themselves out of their existing circumstances. So it's, there's some great work being done in that kind of way. Uh, by the way, that, that practice, they were at 87 schools that day and Agastya Foundation reaches 1.6 million children in village India each year, so it's an, an incredible effort. But the other one which uh, came to my mind was in Portugal. In Portugal, the, uh, what came around Magellan is one part of it, but the one-to-one the -one project, so seemingly a technology project, but really a learning project, uh, it, there's a distinct difference between that and many others, in that the uh, the technology went to the children and families. It didn't go to the schools. And that has, I think, had a, an interesting impact and a different impact from the, so many others where it has streamed out through the schools. And I wondered if you want to say anything about that, Keith, uh, as Thanks, a change. Kevin. Yeah, we... <clears throat> this, uh, Hosen, uh, well, while we're a North American-focused uh, nonprofit, we try to look where innovation is happening. And we were very fascinated by what has been going on uh, in Portugal and just took a delegation there. Uh, since 2007, they've had an initiative which really was um, not an ed education technology strategy or an education strategy. It was an e-government strategy. And it was through schools that they wanted to get uh, uh, connected uh, families. And I think that's an interesting strategy. And it's. Um, I also think it's kind of what we saw in Uruguay, um, where 
um, it was a digital equity strategy and schools were a way to connect, but it wasn't done through the Ministry of Education. Um, I think this whole area of connectedness for your economy and preparedness is really important. And I think that um, starting with, the, you know, I like what Michael Fallon is saying, and I think, but I think we, you know, need to focus on connected learners, and everybody is a learner, and how do you get kind of everybody there? And, you know, the interesting model in Portugal was that, you know, the telecommunications industry sort of paid a third, the government sort of paid a third, and parents paid sort of a, a third, depending on how poor they were, they could pay less. But um, that kind of sharing of costs across what seems to me to be a new kind of model. And um, all of this, uh, Michael's work reminds me of um, Mimi Ito's important work that she's done out of the University of California around how kids actually learn and that so much learning happens outside of school. So I think that that's really key. And it meet, it's incumbent on um, institutions, school leaders and teachers, to connect with different new different partners, um, whether it's parents we've already heard about, but I also think libraries, museums, cultural institutions. Um, I just came back from our National Park Service Education Advisory Board. There are ways to deepen and extend place-based learning back to the school. And so um, I think we got to be a lot more creative about that. And there are huge opportunities for changing it. And the, the last thing I'll say is the U.S. Department of Ed for the last two years has had an effort called Connected Educator. And I guess I'm, I'm not sure if I'm a pessimistic optimist or an optimistic pessimist. <laughs> but um, the good news is, is that we have saw a huge uptake in the number of um, educators who I think are interested in being connected to their peers and we just uh, finished Connected Educator Month this last month. This last month. That said, we've probably only reached you know a, a quarter of educators who are using social media in any way to connect with other teachers. Thanks, um, Keith. And uh, Connected Educator Month, of course, has become international. Uh, yes. So that it's reaching further than it used to reach before. Uh, David Coltart, I cut you off. Sorry. Thank you, Kevin. Just for the benefit of everyone else, I've just come off a four-and-a-half-year stint as Minister of Education in Zimbabwe, uh, which historically has an education system recognised as one of the best in Africa, but which is under extreme threat. Um, and I just want to give an African perspective on, on this debate, um, because in, in so many ways we, we lag behind and... and we're in greater need of education fast forward than any other continent in the world. Um, one thing that struck me is that certainly in Zimbabwe, and I suspect that the situation is far worse in other African countries, that teachers um, have very little assessment themselves um, and there, there's hardly any teacher development that, that is taking, taking place, certainly in Zimbabwe, and as I say, I suspect throughout uh, Africa, and arising from from that, and and tied to this, of course, is the the shocking underfunding of education in in Africa. Uh, when I look at the budgets of, of countries, even poorer countries in Eastern Europe, you know, we we are green with envy. Um, and so, the the chances of being able to finance adequate professional development and, and assessment of teachers are very limited because of the lack of funding. And so we've, we've got to look at strategies uh, which will bridge that gap. And uh, in that regard, I'm very interested in a couple of things that both Michael and Kristen ha have said. Just turning, first of all, to, to Kristen, she made a comment that there's uh, one of the problems was that there's very little feedback from, from heads and fellow teachers. And that I think ties in with Michael's point of collaboration. Um, in an African context, and, and bearing in mind that in Africa, most of the schools are very remote. Uh, the vast majority of people live uh, in remote rural villages. It's very difficult to, to actually conduct uh, uh, teacher development. And, and so really much of the excellence in any school depends on the quality of, of heads. And so we really need a strategy that, 
that tries to develop the skills of heads and so that they become more involved, not just in administration, but, but teaching themselves. And that we develop a new culture amongst heads that, that they are more proactive. Um, Kirsten, I think the point that she, one of the points that she couldn't uh, elaborate on was school autonomy. And, and I think that that's a debate that comes in here because um, so often, certainly in, in more authoritarian states, heads are reluctant to, to be proactive, to, to, to think outside the box because they're subject to uh, very stringent discipline. Um, but that's an, an aspect that I think restrains them we need to, to focus on. Then just a final point, coming back to, to one of Michael's points, um, he, he stressed the need for a proactive look at technology, and, but stressed that needs, I think his words were, it needs to be elegant and easy to use. And uh, one of the things that we've looked at in Zimbabwe is, is how we can try to leapfrog um, using new technologies, iPads, tablets, and, and the like. Um, but, of course, to, to make that technology accessible, once again, it comes back to the heads to ensure that heads are trained in the use of that, that technology. So what I'm trying to do in these few comments is... Um, to, to get the entire panel to, to think of the, the very peculiar challenges that face us in, in the third world, in, in particular in, in Africa. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Hi. Please I like go ahead, Nairobi. No, 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 no. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I really agree with what he just said about uh, changing the way we are thinking about the pedagogies. In this case, uh, I refer to my situation in my country here in Kenya. Uh, we have huge classrooms with very few teachers. So the teacher has a huge workload and trying to see how you can reduce that workload, but it's still encourage exciting learning so that the learners in the class are gaining new skills. It's been a tricky situation. I've, for some of the people who have implemented M-learning and ICT-enabled collaborative learning in the schools, the approach they have taken is train the teachers, especially maybe during the holidays, and then have the teachers train the students while you have people who can collaborate to assist the teachers where they have challenges. So at every one time, the teachers are still learning and improving their skills. The students are engaging with technology to help them gain new skills. And uh, there's like a continuous cycle for learning. Yeah, that's what I wanted to contribute. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. I, I, what I'd like to give an opportunity to is to our two speakers, uh, so to Kristen first and then to Michael, just to respond to uh, some of these things that are arising and some of the questions. So, Kristen. Can, maybe Ken. Um, thanks, Gavin. I'm not exactly sure where to start. I've written so many notes here at this point. But I wanted to come back to something that Tony said a really long time ago um, about you know, this idea that Michael wants things to change in ordinary schools in the next three years, which I think is incredibly noble and ambitious, and what's ha been happening since TALIS 2008. And I think that, you know, I'm, I work at a place where I deal with governments and large data sets, which can be kind of a sad place to be sometimes and very, very interesting place to be sometimes. And what I think is interesting about... Um, the conversations that are happening around improving and the awareness that's happening around the importance of teachers and the need to improve teaching quality, I think is a very good thing. And I think over the past five years with the emergence of the international summits on the teaching profession, which Tony's involved in, where, you know, we have the top 25 uh, countries in PISA, their minister of education and their union leaders come together and talk about a variety of issues. And so we see this idea this idea sharing we see countries learning from each other and really wanting to improve but then when i have some conversations it somehow it's you see these then like pockets of innovation within schools where you see through different organizations european school net through the innovative learning environment work at the oecd all of these amazing innovative schools through partners in learning at microsoft um, who are just doing incredible things kind of almost on their own in spite of the policies and in spite of the assessments and the curriculum rather than because of it. Um, 
that they're, they're showing that they can innovate and change teaching and change learning in spite of what's going on around them. And, and I look at the one hand, these conversations with policymakers, and the other hand, it doesn't seem to be getting down to the school level. I mean, there seems to be this kind of disconnect. And I, I, I look at this example of what's happening in France, where I live right now, um, where uh, primary schools, on, the students only go to school Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And there's a recent reform to um, have students go to school on a Wednesday morning so that they have more class time. And, um, and there's a variety of reasons for this. And there have literally been, and speaking of involvement with the parents, there's literally been parents protesting in the streets. There have been uh, the famous French grève, the strikes of, of teachers. And so it's these kinds of policy changes that, that people are trying to make are just, for some reason, it's not having the outcomes that we want, certainly not happening quickly enough, certainly not engaging the right stakeholders to make sure that they have success. So I'm kind of a good news, bad news person on that one, Gavin. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Good news, bad news, Kristen. Um, and Michael, would you like to come in there? Uh, maybe a, a couple of points. So uh, somebody mentioned the uh, one size does not fit all, which I agree with, but I think it's one of those dangerous half truths uh, uh, because uh, really the question is what size does fit? What are the particulars? And in Australia, the one size does not fit all is being used to legitimize detached school autonomy. That's what it's doing. Uh, detached school autonomy, which is independent schools publicly funded that have no obligation to be part of the system. And they call it, uh, it's because one size doesn't fit all, which translated in the wrong way means you can do anything you want. Uh, so I'm talking about the conditions under which success is palpably happening and can be uh, causally um, um, identified in terms of what is being done to produce the kind of learning we're talking about and the evidence that it works in terms of outcomes. So I want a tight look. I want variation and innovation, but also I want some degree of discipline uh, to that. And, uh, and, and I still think that the collaborative cultures that we're talking about, and somebody mentioned the role of the principal, uh, I just did a book called uh, Principal Maximizing Impact, which really critiques the U.S. for going down the wrong pathway of micromanaging instructional practice, uh, which is where they are trying to, and it's just the wrong use of school leaders' times. But if you, if you translate the school leader's role as one, as one that is right in there causing collaboration within the school and causing schools to learn from each other, that's the role, then you get the effect I'm talking about. So it's, uh, it's really getting, making sure we get at the precision of whatever the alternatives are and not just have slogans about, well, this is uh, going to be better than that. Um, and so I understand the phrase one size fits all because it, it is a counterpoint to the imposed uh, re regimen, but, but, uh, but the new stuff we're talking about needs to be identified, formulated, and sorted out in terms of what's useful and what's not so useful. Thanks for that, I Michael. I, I think w w one of the things that occurs to me there is that, that all these things are more nuanced than, than we tend to think, that it's, it's not simply... Uh, we, if we're not careful, it's full of false dichotomies. What I want to do now is to bring in Ken Royal, uh, who's been monitoring the tweets and to give us a flavour of one or two of those and the questions that are being raised. Ken. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's been going crazy here. Uh, lots of tweets, and I'm trying to, I'll, give you try, I'll try to give you a breakdown of what the themes are. Everyone really likes the debate quality of this, where it's not just doing all the positive, but it's, it's actually a, uh, a little bit of confrontation as well as, as, uh, as talking about new things. Um, the, uh, the, uh, there was a great point by Tom Carroll uh, that in the future there are just learners um, uh, David Coulthard uh, presents the African perspective. Uh, it's shocking that funding and almost lack of professional development for teachers, that's pretty much an international uh, problem, uh, as, as we all see it. Um, the Bringing the parents into this whole uh, issue is, has been brought up many times. Those are pretty, pretty much the hot-button issues here. Uh, they want to see parents as part of the teaching learning process, after all. Uh, they're the major decision makers when it comes to children's lives. Um, the, uh, in Australia, um, this is really the commitment here. We must do whatever it takes 
to lift family, school, community uh, is is pretty much what everyone is, is saying here. They just don't know quite how to do it, so they want some, some help doing that, going from the, uh, the talk to the action. Uh, they like um, Michael Fullen's point about uh, PD is what counts. Um, there's a really a nice section of tweets by um, Lucy Gray, uh, alumnus, uh, what about grassroots efforts for teachers? Can teachers teach themselves? And Michael Fullen came in. We don't want teachers who are not good at that teaching each other. Um, as well as, um, to me, she says, uh, teacher training is completely different than teacher professional development. Um, she also goes on to say, the essential crux of the issue is whether or not school leaders see teachers as deficient or, are, or about empowering. Um, Jim Buchanan, observation, pupils, open to change, parents and teachers, are they resistant to change, is the question. Would you like more? There's plenty. I don't know. I'll, I'll pick it up from there, but we'll be back. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank, thank, you for, thank, you for, thank you for letting me join today. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, well, thank you for being there. Right. I, I think right, since L Lucy has been mentioned in dispatches, and I think perhaps to pick up on that point, uh, uh, is it teacher training or teacher professional development we're talking about? Lucy, would you like to uh, put a voice to your tweets? Apparently not. <laughs> well, I was I was informed. Hi. Oh, I, I, there you are. Hey. Oh, good. There I am. Okay, I had to unmute. Sorry. Hello from Chicago. Um, very happy to be here, and I'm really enjoying this conversation. Uh, I, I'm. I guess I'm. I'm really concerned with. Um, I, th I think it's a progression that teachers go through in order to become an expert teacher. And, and to me, that implies um, professional development as opposed to uh, training. You know, training to me seems like you're imparting skills. And this is more. This is an attitude. This is skills. It's, it's a lot more that's wrapped up in, in, in developing the whole teacher, just as we try to develop the whole child. So um, I'd like to see more of an emphasis on the language that we use around this. I think also training implies that um, teachers are some sort of product or, or entity um, like that. The other thing that's, that's, that's striking me this week, particularly because, uh, as you know, Gavin, um, Steve Harganon and I are running an online conference where teachers are empowered to present. Um, Michael Furtick was one of our keynotes this week. It was great. And, and, and I see a lot of teachers who are really excited to learn and really excited to share, and they're not supported in their schools. So I think that we need to pay more attention to what's going on at the grassroots level. There are good teachers out there who are doing great things, and how do we elevate those people? Thanks, Lucy. Uh, I, I think what's really great about uh, that is what, what you're doing is uh, you're one of the examples of, um, of actually providing a community for teachers uh, and part of the community that was referred to earlier by Michael. So somebody was coming in, somebody else was coming I, in there. Gavin, I wanted to come in. I'm in Bedford Lake, Tim Brighouse. Hi, Tim, um, please come. I just wanted to make a point. I get, and it's getting old, but I get slightly <laughs> irritated because uh, whenever we have these conversations, we don't allow enough uh, around two points. One is differentiation and context, and we get that plea from a number of people. For instance... There's a huge difference within the United Kingdom. I'm unfortunate because I've worked in England. I wish I'd worked in Wales. I did for a bit in Scotland and Northern Ireland because they're very different to work there. I tried to change Birmingham and then I went to London and they're different places. So contexts are immensely different mm. and we really ought to think very hard about that. Now, in England, and I, I hope it's not the same over there, we are bedeviled what I would call... Uh, political requirement to employ one-armed researchers. Now, the one-armed researchers are extraordinary people. When I worked in London, the leader of the authority at that time, it was a very long time ago, he came to me and he said, look, your problem, you're in, you're, you've got a research group and will you please employ one-armed researchers? I said, what the hell are you on about? And he said, well, Whenever I get the research from you, you say, on the one hand, this, and on the other hand, that. I just don't want it. Now, England has been bedeviled by one-armed researchers 
and never more so than at the present. So our accountability system, our exam system, is fierce and it's measuring the wrong things, enough to induce in our system fear in groups of the leaders, particularly at the points where that matter. Now, I don't think that is the case in some other um, territories. And therefore, that's a big difference for pushing. Now, with us, and I think this is a universal truth, I don't know, but it is in the developed world, um, teachers are subverting the whole system because yeah. they are joining in teach meets. Mm. And, they, and by the way, this has happened since the 2008 yeah. TALIS survey. Mm. It's happened with accelerating pace over the last 18 months so that teachers of imagination are getting together absolutely unbeknown to their school um, and are sharing ideas and taking their learning a lot further. Now, that's a wholly promising thing. I have a sympathy, and I'll shut up at this point. The differentiation is not merely between territories. The differentiation of context is, frankly, not allowing that infants are dependent learners. Teenagers are getting beyond independent learners to being interdependent learners, which I would say is profound learning. Uh, and indeed, some of the witness statements we've had alongside me have illustrated that very, very clearly. Uh, so I would wish us, whenever we have the... Try to, trying to sum up afterwards, could we have a map of trying to differentiate some broad categories so that there is more a, a, a more finely focused discussion of it? Michael will not object, I don't think, because I think that uh, his plea about one-size-fitting-all is a very proper plea, namely... Teachers wherever they are. I always remember his book, um, The Meaning of Educational Change. I think it was page 186 in the original version, <laughs> which profoundly affected me, where he quoted Judith Little in America as saying, schools are successful places where teachers talk about teaching, where teachers observe each other's practice, where teachers plan, organise and evaluate together, and where teachers teach each other. Now, he gave a full quote on that at about that point in the book. Uh, it has governed my work ever since. And what we're witnessing at the moment is more opportunities for teachers to talk about teaching. They do it. They're, teach they're observing each other. They're evaluating together. And it's absolutely in his line of collaboration. And they're teaching each other. Uh, so I think there are some general points but I do wish we'd consider the different contexts. And in particular, I'll make one plea I made last night. Would all policymakers please read the latest book by a woman called Nancy Cartwright and Jeremy Hardy about how you make policies fail? It's a really good book. Can I just add one thing? I mean, the title of this debate was New Technologies, New Pedagogies, Is This the Time?, I think the answer to that, therefore, is just yes. It is the time. <laughs> um, it's never been a better time. No. <laughs> in, our, in our territory, may not be true in Africa. Don't know. Uh, Thank you very I, much. I, I, I want, I'm, I'm going to bring in uh, Nick Jones uh, here in Bedpont Lakes, and then we'll go to others. Nick. Uh, thanks very much, Tim. Uh, you, the, um, I've just been off studied, so the fear factor resonated very severely. And, and, it, and it's, it's critical, isn't it? We, we expect so much of, of our teachers in the classroom and actually they are afraid of the, of the one-handed researcher or the, the clipboard Ofsted person uh, with, with very, little, um, very little interest in innovation. Um, and, and it distracts us from the wonderful things that we are trying to do. Um, and I was just jotting down... Um, the, 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 the real challenges, if you, if you try and sum them up, are what I've been going through, I think, in many respects, which is how do you create an innovative culture? How do you generate leaders who can operate really effectively within that, 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 that innovative culture? Uh, a, a question for me is how do you create a predisposition to accept change? Because that's absolutely critical in what do we do how do you build how do you build the technological element into that because we've been trying to do that how do you 
create an accessible, creative, um, innovative curriculum. We, we've not talked much about how you guide students through that process because we can't just accept that every student will live within that creative school culture. Many of them uh, uh, need, need guidance structures, etc. cetera. Um, so it, it's such a complicated thing we're trying to do. Um, and I, I want to agree with Michael as well in, in the sense that, um, that if we're going to put a whole school community in a context of radical change... And we need to remember that change is uncomfortable for everybody. Uh, the, the thing that people, that, that people dislike most is change in, in many respects. Uh, some people love it, but not everybody. Um, we, we, we've got to be really clear about those changes where we make the big leaps, those that we take at very at snail pace. Um, and, and, and we've got to do it by creating collaborative cultures within our schools, but I would argue as well across small groups of schools, because if we're going to do all of those things that I've just described, um, I as a head teacher don't have the capacity to do them all. My school as a school doesn't have the capacity to do it. We can only do it really by really creating sharing collaborative cultures. Um, I hope that's a meaningful contribution. And what, what, what Nick in his modesty doesn't say is that his group of schools cover Sweden, UK and New York, which is quite and interesting. India. And India. I forgot about India. It's quite an interesting mix. So, I, And I just, for to explain the context, uh, Ofsted is our inspector uh, yeah. inspection group, if you like. So they inspect all the schools in England. It's Michelle. Good. It's a yeah. much-loved inspection group. <laughs> <laughs> By some people, indeed. So I want to um, come back to the, this, um, the notion of collaboration, but um, looking at teacher education, initial teacher education and professional development, um, I have a, a, a friend and colleague in Australia, Greg Whitby, who doesn't talk about professional um, development. He talks about teacher learning, and I do like that. I think we should be talking about teacher learning. Um, but one of the most effective ways I've seen of bringing initial edu teacher education and, and teacher learning together is for it to happen together. And it doesn't. They happen in isolation. So the teachers are taught one thing in, in, in... New teachers are taught one thing in their college of education and then they go into schools and they see a completely different paradigm and different pedagogies to the ones that they've been talking about. And they come back very confused. And I, I used to be a teacher educator and I've been through that. So you're trying... you know, As, as a teacher educator, I was trying to change systems, but it was really impossible to do that. Um when the schools were not part of that culture. So the collaboration was not happening between teacher education and schools, even though it was meant to be with the mentoring system and everything. And we need to see much more of a meshing of teacher learning that covers beginning teachers as well as existing teachers in the classroom. Thanks, Michelle. Can I add one thing here? Um, this is... Uh... <coughs> Sorry, please go ahead. Oh, OK. Um, the, uh, what was interesting about this discussion is... Um, I, I ran out of space when I, uh, for my notes, so I found a plate um, uh, with all the notes on it, and I, I was started to spin the plate um, a little bit because, um, you know, I don't think that the idea of one size doesn't fit all is a facile excuse. Um, I think one size doesn't fit all, and um, we've heard about schools of education are the issue, uh, parents, technology in school, out of school, about digital equity, about M-learning, about financing. Uh, we've heard teachers are the problem. We've heard teachers are the solution. We've talked about isolation. We've talked about time. We've talked about place-based uh, education. We've talked about parents and context. Uh, we've talked about do it in three years. Uh, we've talked about autonomy. We've talked about push-pull. We've talked about differentiation and context. We've talked about one-armed researchers and huge classrooms. And in the end, I keep on thinking about the skills that need to be built inside of people um, rather than, you know, given to them, um, you know, pushed on them. Parents, for instance, are absolutely essential. Um, and uh, to, to think that there is um, a set of skills or a set of policies that inform 
those, uh, you know, those parents, that's impossible. It's all contextual. Um, and I think that, you know, um, it's sort of this, I'll, I'll just leave with, with this, is that if we, if we examine all the stuff we've had in, you know, eight debates and, and, um, and, and think about how what we've learned uh, or any of us have learned can be applied in this particular context. It just keep I just keep on uh, getting reminded of. I guess this is the old undergraduate uh, days about um, this Alfred North Whitehead uh, quotation, uh, uh, which is um, you know a, a tradition. A traditional is you know um, the uh, living the dead ideas of the living. And tradition is the living ideas of the dead. And when we think about the way in which we can take all this in, and I don't have to spin this plate all the time, um, is because I want to be able to, in this context, be able to say, you know what, in this case, the real tipping point is, is parents. In this case, it's taking the technology out of the picture. And so what I'm trying to do is make sense of the debates in the context of um, how we can build inside of people um, and how people can absorb that themselves, especially when teachers are collaborating with each other because they're generally driving that change. So, you know, that's the issue for me is the way in which leaders can absorb all this. And this can be internal um, rather than something that's imposed from the outside. Fred, thank you. And uh, that's a nice pulling together of things. Uh, I think... Uh, one of the critical things from these debates is that uh, and one of our aims in education for fast forward is to move on to actions from the debates. And part of that is the internalisation of all these conversations uh, and coming out with a direction of action and some... But his plate wasn't spinning. But No, plate's spinning. We can come back to that okay, right. yeah. when they've fallen down. Um, I would like to go over to Brian Lewis in Washington. Brian, you've been very quiet. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I, I, I have uh, given some thought to some of the comments, and I have a couple of thoughts. Years ago, I did work in, primarily in California in community engagement. There's been discussion about parental and parent uh, engagement in learning. And in the consulting work that my colleagues at the time and I did, one of the things we learned was that an, an oftentimes districts and schools believe that they are truly engaged with parents, and what they find is that they're really not. And what we found in some of the focus group work we did was, was that listening was missing. That is to say, when we sat down and actually engaged with the various stakeholders in the community, they really felt listened to for the first time. And it was uh, alarming to the districts that we worked with that, in fact, the parents and the various stakeholders in the community that they thought they had listened to did not perceive that they had been listened to. So just a thought about listening as a key component of parental and community engagement and learning. And the second point I wanted to make was this notion of what, what took 25 or 30 years to evolve in, in terms of teacher collaboration, professional learning networks. Uh, I'm not a teacher. My wife is in her 33rd year of teaching. And when she started out in a one-school school district with one class per grade where teachers were isolated back in 1981 and progressed through her career in two different districts to a place where she was out of the classroom for a decade doing pull-out reading specialist work. And then, of course, because of budget, that program was cut. And then at what she considered to be a fairly advanced age was back in the classroom in, at first grade. And she said to me, I don't know that I can do first grade at my age. But she would tell you today that the reason she succeeded in that, in that transition back to the classroom was because of the collaborative support of her cadre of first grade teachers, all of whom she would point out were younger than herself. And were it not for that collaborative support that didn't exist in 1981, uh, it, she, she doesn't believe she would have, would have successfully or as successfully have made that transition. And a key part of that is, as others here today have pointed out, is the key role of leadership and site and district level, level culture about what it means to be a collaborative uh, professional learning network as teachers. Thanks, Brian. You should have spoken up earlier. <laughs> um, Lexi. Yeah, most definitely. Oh, um, Coming from a complete student point of view, I think I completely agree that, um, you know, teachers can feel intimidated in a classroom, especially when there's a majority of students 30 plus. And obviously we don't get that in my school. Um, but what I find nicely about that is because you really like build a personal relationship with that teacher. And that teacher then feels confident enough to then go and speak to you personally on a level. Therefore, they don't actually feel overwhelmed when they're walking into the classroom. 
And I think that can, um, like, when it is a classroom builder of uh, 30, 20 to 30 students, I think that the teacher can feel insecure because it is so many intimidating students looking at that one teacher and expecting them to have all of the answers. So I think, um, well, thinking of this from a business perspective, um, it's the same as, like, marketing. Like, what we're trying to do is um, find out how teachers, how we're going to um, get them and how we're going to motivate them and how we're going to make them feel comfortable in every situation in their personal environment. And I think by doing that in um, employee motivation, especially in marketing business terms, non-financially non non speaking, is um, not only reducing the class sizes and having different colleges within the um, school, but also having like headmasters, for example, going down and speaking to those teachers after school and just congratulations, even if it's just as simple as a pat on the back. Like I know a lot of schools, a lot of the headmasters don't come out of the office and they're very disclosed and are not a part of the school in any way. And I feel like certain headmasters like myself, Nick Jones, who spoke earlier, is um, I actually witnessed earlier actually just praising one of the um, one of the leading teachers in our school. And that actually like boosts a lot of confidence. So then, then she can go on to the rest of the day to help provide you know, the confidence and the support that the rest of the students need. And I think that is a crucial role and in, that needs to be in any school. And if that isn't in education today, then like, what, the, there's no point at the end of the day because the teachers are just going to be stressed out. The students are going to pick up from those feelings and then it's all going to be a very controversy mess. You know, it's such an interesting point. Oh, dear, Tony, do you remember when we visited schools in Rio de Janeiro last year? And the, we all commented, didn't we, that the... Uh, the relationship between the, the teachers and the students in those schools, it, it was like going into a family situation where the teacher was either mum or dad. And it was it was stark, actually, just how wonderful that was. So that's an interesting point that you're making, Lexi. Do you remember that, Tony? I do, Jim. Um, and I think that part of the value of this conversation today is that uh, the question about the future of the profession uh, and the way in which we describe and define the profession is coming into sharp focus. I don't think anybody is suggesting that we do not need expert practitioners to be able to advance this agenda. You can't get deep learning without expert practitioners. But I think the question about who the other players are in the learning game is becoming increasingly important to us. And, Tim, your point about different contexts, we've got now a more differentiated workforce. We've got partnerships that we've talked about today in terms of parents and others, your point, Jim, about communities that are strongly connected with each other, with a value base, which is what you're talking about in terms of the Rio de Janeiro experience, that really focuses attention around support for learners and learner agency itself. I think we could get into some pretty decent debate about whether or not the future of the teaching profession uh, is one that we should have on the agenda uh, for a future fast forward, because... Today, we have brought into sharp relief the question about the role of government. We've brought into sharp relief about the role of new players in the market. We need, I reckon, have a bit more time to talk about the future of the profession itself. I think that's a, 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 an, interesting, uh, an interesting point, and I'm sure that is something we'll pick up on. I think uh, now's the time to go back to the tweets and uh, to Ken. Ken, where are we with uh, questions coming in and the flavour of things from Twitter sphere? Hello again. Uh, I think I have um, something that can kind of get you going again. I, I, um, the tweets are phenomenal, and um, it, you could write a book on these. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, the, uh, the part where uh, the overall um, PISA confer confirms teacher-related factors make a huge difference. Teachers must be highly skilled, well-resourced, and motivated. Um, supporting uh, also is risk-taking, and uh, the tweets want to know whether having teachers, educators take risks is something that they do as heads of, of buildings, heads of schools, heads of districts. And time, time, time. Is it fair to say that teachers want to improve practice, but time is a huge barrier? Uh, we also have... Uh, we are all learners, all pupils, teachers, parents. How best to bring these all into the class? Is it technology? And that's the question. Um, another tweet brings up 
Twitter and virtual personal learning networks? Um, how are they going to be used? Um, from, from Africa we have, teachers are encouraged to share resources and collaborate, something that's already happening in Kenya. And there's a lot more about pre-service educators. There was a mention of that earlier on. Uh, are they prepared for today's learners when they enter their profession? And that might be a question for Kristen to answer with Talis. Uh, there's also this one I think was interesting. What does success look like? To whom? The diversity of learners or the school system? Do great school cultures happen serendipitously? Uh, how do you hire for innovation? And there's a Twitter watch here. Uh, PD funding, it's an international problem. Parent involvement is the key. Family, school, communities are the key. And as Jim uh, said, uh, teaching quality varies more than school uh, within schools than between schools. I don't quite understand that, but maybe that's something that you can talk about. And that's from the Twitter world. No, that was it. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'd like to nip back to Michael. Uh, Michael Pullen, this is. So, Mr. Fardick, sit down. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Michael, just talking about the time issue and uh, how that relates to the new pedagogy's work and uh, the productivity issue that might be alongside of that. Is there something you could say on that? Well, I just, you know, Ken says that we got a lot of tweeting around uh, school teachers saying, we haven't got time to do this. And then Michael says, what did you say, Michael? It's two for one. We, we can get, we can release time by employing new pedagogies. So it does seem to be critical that rather than people see new pedagogies as taking up time, they're going to release time to enable new pedagogies. So this seems to be a core issue. Yeah, you could, uh, I mean, you could take it as a chicken and egg problem. Teachers say they don't have enough time because of what the government is imposing on them. And uh, therefore... The solution has to be, I'm a teacher, I'm going to wait for the government or press them to change. You'll be waiting a very long time. Uh, so uh, the, uh, I think actually that the question of the lack of time is a surface excuse. I don't mean to be unempathetic un about the issue because it is a real problem. Uh, but, uh, but if we take the professional learning communities, Rick Dufour's work, you can go on their website and ask the question. He's got FAQ. Uh, how do teachers find time? Get, he'll give you 150 strategies for finding time, that, that most of which don't cost money. So I think it's, it, it's an absolute dilemma. But in the schools that we're working with, and I'm talking about whole districts, uh, York Region, uh, we know fairly well, 180 schools, uh, that time is um, created by a lot of different ways within the school uh, on, within the school day, yes, release uh, some of it, but there's uh, the collaborative schools that are flourishing, people are getting together because they want to get together. When Tim said teachers of imagination are subverting the process, I bet they're spending some time to do that. Uh, they, they don't say we don't have time exactly. to subvert the process to show our imagination. <laughs> they just go and they do it. So so I, I, think, I think it is an understandable one, but you've got to break through that and create the, uh, the conditions under which teachers find that it's worthwhile. I, I've said recently, if you're in a bad relationship, you'd rather be alone. But you don't want to be alone. You want to be in a good relationship. And that's where we're heading with this collaboration. So I do uh, I, I want to say to Tim, I absolutely agree with him, but my, my point is, how do leaders create the culture where te good teachers don't have to subvert the process? That is the process. The new process is to have imagination and learning and exchanges uh, coming out of that relationship. Uh, I want to say one other thing. I, I also agree with all, all the different conditions, uh, uh, two parts about this. Uh, the one-size-fits-all, I think there actually is a version of one-size-fits-all, which is every culture a learning culture. That's one size. I mean, there are variations on that, but it's a, it's a non-negotiable requirement that every cis, uh, society or a cis situation should uh, develop. I liked Lucy's comment about the what is the progression, how teachers become expert learners. Let's add also, what is the progression where students become expert learners? That's what we're talking about. Those two things are going in concert. And I'd say one last thing that hasn't come up, but I want to say it, is the whole part about involving parents. 
Um, I think under certain conditions, the linkage and starting with community is a really a fundamental starting point. Uh, uh, we haven't talked about early learning, but let's say prenatal to age six. There's a whole set of things in there that involve parents and community and students and uh, your children and, uh, and adults. So there's a lot of things where you could get off on the right foot if you had that, that would build in the parent connection. Finally, I would say what we've observed is that when teachers' confidence gets built up in working together, they start to reach out to parents as part of the pro uh, solution, I should say, rather than part of the problem. Uh, the more confident teachers are together about what they're doing, the more they want parents engaged. So there's a good uh, uh, kind of double agenda here, if you can get it right. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm at the same time in a lot of countries, mm -hmm. I, am, I certainly would support non-formal learning and engagement and connectedness as part of the context under which uh, this will uh, develop more towards the, what we're aiming for. Thanks, Michael. I'd, it only made me think that subversion is such fun too, but uh, <laughs> so we're just working out how to make that work in the right way. Uh, Kristen, I wonder if you'd like to pick up on anything there. I was just going to unmute myself anyway, Gavin, so good timing. Um, I love what Michael just said about schools, like the time is created in schools for these kinds of things to happen. And um, it's funny because one of the practices, I think Michelle was talking about team teaching and teachers observing other teachers. And one of the practices that I see in schools that seems so easy is for the head teacher just to make time for teachers to go into their colleagues' classrooms, observe a lesson, and then talk about it afterwards and how to make it better. And these kinds of things can, can help develop and improve a teacher's teaching very, very easily. Um, one of the other things, talking about student feedback and kind of the student um, perceptions of how, how teachers are teaching, there's a really interesting practice that's happening in, in two countries that I'd like to mention that we learned about recently, and, and it's it's this idea of uh, having a student perception survey for how students are feeling about the teacher's teaching. And this is not tied to a teacher's evaluation. This is not a student um, rating the teacher, so to speak. In Sweden, teachers are using this for um, privately, totally privately, so that it's confidential. They see what the teachers in their class are saying, or the, excuse me, the students in their class are saying about the teaching, and they can see immediately if it's motivating students and if it's getting the point across. In Norway, they've gone a step further. The student union and the teachers union have met to create criteria for how students can provide feedback on teachers' teaching. And I just think this kind of activity is fantastic because it contributes to this idea of having a reflective practice for teachers so that they're constantly trying to improve. And I think this is one way to, um, and it doesn't really take a ton of extra time, um, and it's not outside of school, so I think this is one way or a couple ideas that, that maybe can help get us towards where Michael wants us to go. Thanks, Kristen. And I think actually picking up all these uh, or a number of these different ideas from different parts of the world, I think that's part of what ed Education Fast Forward is about. Uh, but uh, telling those stories so that we can take from them the positive things we might do to improve the situation in our own context is really important. I'd like to uh, jump to Jenny Lewis in Sydney, if Jenny is there. <laughs> Hi, how are you going? I'm good. I'm sure you have That's one or two good. comments to make. What time is it? This <laughs> it's after one o'clock in the morning, so excuse it. Oh, well. It might be a bit of a bleary conversation. <laughs> but um, I, I've been collecting some thoughts throughout this uh, this story, and, um, and I started to think about um, the progression to collective conversations and collective community. And, and thinking about, well, if that's the answer, what's the problem? Um, many of us have been doing uh, similar community-focused collaborations with teachers for some years and haven't had the impact. Uh, a lot of people have felt much better. There's been a lot of social improvement, collegiality. Well, what's actually changed in terms of the... Uh, teacher or the student outcome. Um, I think we're still visibly seeing the right teacher. Um, I still think we're talking about improvement of practice. But one of the things that actually hasn't been focused on <clears throat> is the um, what the teacher still isn't able to do. And what we've been finding in some of the research here is that at the end of the day, 
they're having conversations with each other, but at, at the wrong level. Teachers still aren't able to explain what they're actually doing to change student practice. They actually can't explain what they've actually done in the classroom to get the impact. They can't actually explain when they're actually doing something that's risky and when they're doing something successful, but they're still having great collegial conversations. There's time being created, but they're still doing the old stuff all over again. So if we are going to um, focus um, more rigorously on co uh, collective conversations and collective community and a focus on improving practice, then the teachers need the language to actually explain what they're doing well and not doing well and what they're going to do about it, and that still isn't happening. Thank you, Jenny, and uh, I, you can go out and party after this. I yeah, well... Which, right, <laughs> I, I can add. I, but I'd, I'd like to... Yeah, Gavin, yeah, could, I, could I make one observation on the time? Because Tom, that's go really ahead. important, what was yep. just said. I'd, I'd like to pick up on what Michael just said in what we just heard from Australia. I, I love that phrase that you just used, creating time. Um, and I think that it's, it's important for us to understand that if we talk about it as finding time versus making time or creating time, that's very different. Finding time is kind of accepting the structure and organization of work as it is and finding workarounds versus teachers taking control of their structure and organization of work so that they make the time, they create the time, they build the time into uh, their, their fabric of work in their schools. So the final point I would make is I'm, I'm kind of with uh, Michael on this, on time. I, w I wouldn't say it's necessarily a, an excuse, but basically it's not about time. It's at all. It's about this, the organization of work. It's the structure of work and organization of work that's in the way. And it's changing that structure and organization that, in fact, creates or makes the time. Thanks, Tom. I, uh, absolutely. I had a conversation earlier this week uh, with people about uh, the, uh, the use of time by students. And essentially that was that the way that uh, so much of uh, traditional teaching and traditional approaches to curriculum are handled, which is uh, feeding it out in a particular pattern without uh, necessarily taking account of how quickly students can uh, adopt it, is one of the ways that we manage to use up our time but not necessarily use it most effectively. I'd like John Connell to come in because you've been very quiet, John. No, not on, you've been tweeting a lot there. I did, but very quiet in terms of sound, not so quiet in terms of words. So you're, you're <laughs> such a traditionalist, Gavin, that's the problem. Isn't it? <laughs> it's true. Uh, 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 John. Online. Thank you, Gavin. I, I guess um, we all tend to gravitate towards those who express views that we agree with, and there, there, there have certainly been many uh, in the last hour and a half or so that I, I've agreed with. Um, you know, the idea that uh, innovation and variety in pedagogy and teachers is essential is absolutely critical. And it's good to see that TALIS is offering some validation for that. Um, I think the idea of building feedback within the schools between teaching colleagues is really heavily dependent on uh, the quality of the leadership in the school. And some notion of pedagogic leadership is critical to that. Um, what does that mean for uh, you know, the kinds of people that we employ as leaders in schools? Are, are they, should they be good business managers or should they be more than that? Should they be pedagogic leaders? And I think it's the latter. Um, of course, somebody mentioned earlier on that the, the system is important too. I think the influence of the wider system is critical. And if you're in a national education culture, for instance, where, where it's backward-looking or heavily bureaucratic, then the whole system becomes anti-innovation, anti-risk. And it's then dependent on the individual schools, individual head teachers, school principals, teachers to actually make the break and try to be innovative in what they do. Um, Greg Butler's point about archaic assessment is, is, is spot on, absolutely spot on. And I also agree completely with Tom Carroll. You know, he said at some level we have to try to find a way to move away from the artificial roles of teacher and learner, te or te teacher and student, and see schools as, as more as communities of learners. You know, the teacher might be seen as a, a, a learner primus in, in, inter pares, but I recognise that we're all learners together um, as a critical step for us to take. I, I just happen to think that so much of um, formal education 
is built really on, on a, a kind of illusory foundation. And that's the fallacy that students learn what is taught to them. Uh, that, that teachers teach what students learn. And, and we have to try to, to see the reality behind that. What is the actual nature of learning? And then build pedagogy on top of that. So that's my point. Thanks, John. That just, uh, for some reason, that makes me think of the underground system and mind the gap. <laughs> There's a gap between teaching and learning, and it's, yeah, it's definitely something that's there. Um, at this stage, Jim, have you anything more well, you like to add? I'm just wondering if we are... I just want to go back to the exam question we've set ourselves today, which is uh, new pedagogies. Is this the time in the last sort of 15 minutes or so? Because the time has just flown over. <coughs> this not only is the, the most number of people, it's the longest debate time we've had, and I don't know where the time's gone. But I guess the last 10 minutes or so, Gavin, we should just open the floor to see... Because EFF has always wanted to precipitate action. Uh, it's probably the thing we've done least well. Um, we've, we've, but we didn't just want to have a talking shop. Um, so how can we take this question and make people think that this is the time to try new pedagogies? Uh, just one last thing. I, I remember last year the head of the National Association of Head Teachers in the UK said that 75% of the questions he gets from head teachers about have I got the freedom to do this, the answer is usually yes within the system. They actually have a lot more freedom to do innovative things than they realise. Mm -hmm. So that, that tells me that there's a problem about new pedagogies that's inside people's head rather than inside the system. So what are we going to do? What's the action? Have we addressed the question? Well, How can we help people move forward? I mean, it seems to me that well, somehow we have to influence policymakers because they are the they are the gatekeepers of any educational change at the end of the day. And we, we do see a lot of policymakers going backwards rather than going forwards. And I'm not going to mention any particular Which country. Which country you mean, Michelle? Yeah, well, you know, Jim, what I mean. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we do have... It, you know, it is a problem, and I think, you know, t people are risk-averse. Teachers are necessarily risk-averse. Education is so political. And I think it's... Policymakers are very scared to actually do this big leap that we all know needs to be done in order to get the changes that we're talking about. And I, you know, I'm throwing the question open: is how do we influence policymakers? How do we get them to understand without poo-pooing educational research, one-handed or two-handed researchers? <laughs> Uh, you know, how do we get them to listen and to actually do make the changes, help schools to make those changes, give them the permissions, give them the space that um, Tom was talking about? Tim, uh, I think you might like to come in there. Um, I actually, I hope Michael will pick this one up right at the end because he's been extraordinarily successful in influencing different systems to adopt change. So as Tony has got a view in this room, in my room, about the 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 possibility of change in different jurisdictions, and I absolutely relate to the last point, namely that I think we're in England, and I, it, it isn't true of Scotland or Wales. I make the point, but in England we are peculiarly stuck with an exam and accountability system which would make even the bravest teachers say, well, we need some innovative ways around that. And I think they have got some innovative ways around it. People who have two timetables and work out that, you know, they'll spend a week and, or they'll look beyond the school day or they'll define a set of experiences that all kids will have. I, I mean, there are ways in which people do it, but my great hope is that we could pick up that idea of having a debate about the profession, because certainly in this jurisdiction, uh, the profession isn't in a position to influence policymakers in the way I think they would wish. Uh, but I'm sure there are ways around it, and there are plenty of schools doing it, but I'm saying it, they're doing it against the odds, against the tide, rather than supported by the tide. David, uh, David Coltart in South Africa, I wonder if you would like to come in there and from, from your point of view. Well, I just wanted to come back to the point regarding, the, you know, changes. And it isn't one of the problem, problems worldwide that, and ironically, it, it's uh, a consequence of, of democracy, that you've got politicians 
uh, who are in office for a short period of time, and they're very anxious about uh, being responsible for major uh, changes, for example, in in teaching systems. Um, uh, they then get blamed if they go wrong, and many of these need quite a, a long span of time to, to affect, and it, I think politicians themselves are very hesitant, and if we come closer to home, I'm, I'm in Johannesburg, South Africa, and South Africa has had a disastrous experiment uh, with their curriculum, for example. They changed their curriculum, and they've, they've now had to change it back again, and there was a lot of mud on politicians' faces. Thank you, David. Uh, I, if we go to uh, Michael now, I wonder if uh, you would pick up on some of these points and uh, how we move to changing actual systems to the action there. Um, yeah, well, Greg mentioned before that one of the key blocking areas in a lot of countries is the assessment examination system, and I think the pressure on that, coming from the deep learning um, uh, and the uh, side, is mounting. And that pressure will be successful to the extent that we have measures that are actually uh, doing new measures. And so I think the, the, it's, the, it's the thing about change is you can't criticize something effectively unless you have a, an increasingly well-developed alternative replacement for what you're criticizing. So I think the work on the alternative replacement is, a, is an important one. Uh, the other uh, thing about change in the, in the, the system I th uh, there's a superintendent we work with in California who says about the policy uh, level, uh, says, every time the state puts up walls, I punch holes in them. She, she doesn't brag about it and doesn't go to them and say, I'm punching holes in it. But she's actually, uh, despite the system, is going about doing things. So it goes back to that point, and Seymour Saracen made it in 1970. He said there's a lot more room for doing things than people perceive there is. They, they put self-limitations on it. So I think that's the second thing. Uh, the third thing is um, the way to change uh, teachers for, for me. Uh, I'll, I'll say two ways that teachers won't change, two strategies. One is increased moral exhortation. That's not a good strategy. Do, do it for the, for the good of the kids. And, uh, second thing, they won't change uh, based on research evidence. Here's a, here's a school just like yours doing this, therefore you should do it. And I think the reason that those don't work is one says you should do it, the other says it can be done. Neither of them help them do it. And so this comes back to leadership, creating climates of non-judgmentalism where people are doing innovative things with, uh, with the support of leaders closest to them and, uh, and that that new experience of getting success is what changes people's minds. And when they, their, their minds change because they've have, they now see it can be done. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think another example... Uh, one of Ofsted's reports last year, which is called Unseen Children, was uh, based on a study. Uh, they, uh, they looked at failing schools 20 years ago and revisited these same schools and found a number of them that hadn't changed. And I love the, the punchline. The punchline is this, that the schools that had not changed had never seen a school like theirs that had been successful. Even though there were schools like theirs that had been successful, they just had never seen it. That's why they didn't change. They, didn't, they had the moral exhortation. The research was uh, around. But they didn't have the connectedness with success that would show that it can be done. And then I, I want to close with a... I'm sorry, it's, it's really kind of a facetious comment about time, but for this, it'll either be humorous or, or at least it'll be... Uh, it might be more than that. If you're in a toxic culture, you don't complain about the lack of time to keep it toxic. You do it because it's important. I'm using a negative example. If you're out to get someone, let's take revenge. Nobody who's getting to revenge says, oh, I don't have time to be revengeful. It's important to me. So I want to flip it around and say the positive version of this is I've got such a moral imperative. I've got such colleagues and we've got such opportunity that we, we're going to find a way to do it. I mean, this is the definition of an entrepreneurialism. It's doing something when you don't have the resources to do it making sure it gets done because it's important. And I actually think there is a lot of resources now. There's more uh, receptivity to the kinds of things we're talking about, so it's more positive that way. But we can't wait to kind of, um, for the other, you know, if, if only the system would change, I would be better off. 
that just blocks us as in. It's got to be that let's make it happen. And I can see uh, the policymakers that we've interacted with, the ones in Ontario, the current, current Premier, Kathleen Wynne, uh, the, P, the governor in California, the superintendent in California, uh, there's a lot more uh, receptivity to what we call the right drivers, uh, capacity building and collaboration and so forth and different ways of assessment. A lot more receptivity on the part of policymakers than before. They're still in the minority, but they're not, a, uh, they're not isolated. They're kind of uh, m mounting because, uh, uh, and I think the, the, this is a turning point in the next while. Actually, deep down, I would say politicians know that the old strategies don't work. The evidence is, is there. It's clear. And so to know that it doesn't work is an opening for us. And to get it working in some systems is really what the goal should be right now. It's both a macro and a micro initiative. You've got to have lots of examples on the ground where locals are ahead of the center. And then you have to have some examples where the center picks it up and cultivates it. Just to build on that. Thanks, Michael. I was just, I'm just go going ahead, to, Gavin. sorry, yeah. you go ahead, Michael. I was just yeah. going to pass across to you. But oh, sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that I think in terms of influencing policymakers, I just want to emphasize the importance, I think, of public engagement. We heard about teachers. We worked with the Simcoe County School Board uh, to, on a conference called What the Tech with Taking It Global, where we brought parents together with teachers to learn about practice change and really try to give them the flexibility and the support they need to advocate for those policies. So really increasing public engagement, showing those local examples, I think will be key to policymakers feeling like they have the freedom and the support of parents to make some of these changes. Thanks, Michael. That's a really good point. I, I mean, there's part of me that thinks uh, we're, we're all in this together, actually, and I don't think there's many people really against things, but it's how we help each other to get to the right place. And it kind of makes me think along the lines of us, not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, that kind of thing. We should be all in that positive framework. And I sort of wonder, uh, Jim and I have worked on uh, a failure fest uh, not so long ago, where people, one of the rules of the failure fest is that you have five minutes to talk about your failures, but in that five minutes you shouldn't blame anybody else. You say what you got wrong and what you would like to have done better, what you learned from the experience. And maybe we should do just a few more of those. Uh, to to open up the thinking, to make it uh, make it okay not to be work behaving perfectly, but to understand better how we might improve. I just need more than five minutes next time. I know you. <laughs> Gavin, like can, I, can, can I can I just say sorry, Gavin? It's Kristen. I'm not sure where you were going to go, but I just wanted to say I was going to go to you, Kristen, uh, because we we're beginning to run out of time. So something's working. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to go back to what Jim was saying, also about what what can we actually do next. And one of the things I wanted to mention is that the PISA results are going to be re released on December 3rd. And we all know what happens when PISA results are released. The media reports on the league tables and the league tables only. And the uh, policymakers tend to use the PISA results to go ahead and keep doing whatever it was they were doing or wanted to do anyway. And I think we have some amazing ideas in this conversation. And and. We have some amazing people with strong voices here who can be part of the conversation. And so I think what I would encourage us to do is for all of us to, to join in and, and try to make our voices heard uh, over the, the roar of the, the league tables that come out for PISA. Because I think I have not seen the PISA results. I'm sure there will be some changes and um, countries will be happy or not happy. And um, and we need to... Uh, well, you've seen them. Come on, let us... I have not. Us. I have not. It's questions. top secret. Seriously, it's private, I have not seen we've, them. We're all private. We won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, There's only not many people watching it online. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I would just encourage us to be... to make our voices heard there as well. I mean, it makes me... I often talk about TALIS as a way for the teachers that don't like PISA, for teachers to have their voices heard. And I would encourage all of you to do the same thing. Um, we don't want teachers to be blamed for all of the things that may happen in PISA. So um, that's just my last comment. Thanks, Gavin. That's brilliant, Kristen. Thank you. I'm going to cut off uh, other uh, contributions at this point because we're going uh, in a moment. I'll go finally to Michael Fullen to say the last words and to point towards the next debate. Um, but I, I want to kind of just give a couple of words of summary. I, you know, there's a few key, key things that come to my mind. I, it was said in the course of the conversation, uh, new pedagogies, pedagogies, is this the time? And we said, yes, it is the time. It seems to be an extraordinary opportunity that we have. And actually to build a movement towards that in a range of different ways seems to be the right thing to be doing. 
Other things that came through to me, uh, although it wasn't said, but I take it that context is king, not content. Uh, context is uh, absolutely crucial in what we're doing. The importance of listening, the importance of differentiation. And I, bundling that together begins to me to point towards the importance of the reprofessionalization or the professionalization of teachers to be able to uh, manage the process of learning in a slightly different way, uh, but to have greater scope for doing so. And that's not to reinforce the old methods of learning, but to do them in new ways. Uh, also in here was the uh, issues around the organisation of teachers and time. Actually, how it is possible to gain more time by organising ourselves differently. And a, a final statement, which I loved, which was every culture a learning culture, which is something I think we might all take away with us. Now, with, after that, what I would like to do is to, um, to thank people. So, firstly, I'd like to thank Mary, Joe and Bonnie for pulling this whole debate together. Without, that, uh, without their support and without their work, we, none of this would happen. Uh, so that's brilliant. I'd like to thank David, uh, Michael and Kristen for leading, leading off and uh, contributing to the debate as we went through it all. I'd like to thank all the debaters who had the privilege, I, I, I hope you consider it that, of taking part in this through telepresence, uh, plus all the people who've been looking through the uh, video streaming at what's going on and all those who've contributed to tweets because all of that will be pulled together to make a, a, a resource, if you like, of what has gone on here. Uh, and ultimately, that can be set alongside the, um, the recording of this debate, so for a few, which you might like to look at for a future reference in some way. Hey, hey, Gavin, can I try something? Yes. Can we ask everybody to come off mute and give a, the first global round of applause for this debate before we hand over to Michael. <laughs> OK, a global round of applause. See so, you. well done. Yeah. Well, my only disappointing disappointment, it wasn't a standing ovation, but next time, <laughs> we can go one better next time. And with that, I think we've just a couple of minutes more, and I'll go hand back, back to Michael. And that's what you said as well. You go back on mute. Please go back on mute, <laughs> apart from Michael, um, Michael Fullen to have the last words. Well, thank you uh, for inviting us and for the whole uh, preparation and the, the last two hours. It flew by great ideas. And so, uh, like uh, uh, Kristen, I really appreciate the opportunity and always gain from the questions. Uh, just a couple of things I want to say. One, we did, one issue we didn't resolve was mm -hmm. what Eduardo and I think it was uh, Frank <laughs> raised, which is you should do away with... Uh, uh, the, the roles of teachers and, uh, and students and even the, uh, even the role of schools should do away with that and create a more natural system. So that, that we didn't resolve. Uh, I personally am not in favour of that because I don't think it will um, get implemented well and I think it will fall apart in implementation. What I do think is that we need to do the following things. Make sure we're talking about whole system change, not just piecemeal, not this, this or that school or that this or that exception, but the entire system. That system could be a state, a country. I suppose it could be a district, but we're always working with, uh, with that kind of de development. Secondly, within that, we want pedagogical precision, not a particular position, precision, but the actual, what are, what are we talking about that, that's going to happen here that will make it better? We want that pedagogical precision to stand the linkage, the evidence-based linkage to uh, are people engaged more? Are they learning more or not? Uh, and we want also to see the um, elaboration, I guess I'll say, of purposeful collaboration. Uh, I would not use the word scaling up. I would use the word diffusion. That the diffusion of purposeful collaboration is really what the root that I think we're, we're, uh, we're talking about. So I think uh, this really... Uh, I'm we excited got one more because, minute, uh, Michael. Okay. One more minute. I'll be, and then we I'll be less, less excited then. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I think that... that uh, this is this is really uh, has a big chance of happening. The work we're doing, Greg, Greg Butler and Tony and others with the thousand schools that we just started. There's a real appetite for real uh, for this big examples of change right now, and we have we will have plenty of takers if we do it right. Thank you very thank much, you. Michael, and thank you everybody for taking part in today's debate.
Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, everybody. Safe journeys home. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank Bye. You. Bye.